Ireland. So if I start by checking we have quorum, which we do, and we have no apologies, declarations of interest, I have two. Uh, one, Michelle Scott, who is presenting to the committee later today, is cousin of my long-term partner and also student loan company. I am still repaying my student loan to the student loan company. I'm on a plan one, so this will impact me. Anyone? Um, I'm interested. I have a student loan as yeah. well. Yeah. No, no problem. Is Mr. Clark a student loan as well? Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately. <laughs> 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 No problem. Uh, Chairperson's <coughs> business. Only one I have, Clark, is the meeting that you and I undertook with the City of London <coughs> Corporation yesterday to discuss their ambitions to continue to work closely with the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive. And our friends in the North West will be pleased to know that the Corporation are spending the day today in the North West also. Uh, draft minutes, members. Are members content that they are a true and accurate ref reflection of our last meeting? Yeah. They're agreed. Uh, matters arising, Clark, do we have any? None. None. Does any member wish to raise any? None. Okay. We'll then move to delegated legislation, which is item number six, student loan repayment. Members will see at page 18 of our packs that they can find the clerk's covering memo and copy of SL1 for the proposed statutory rule, the Education Student Loans Repayment Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will be subject to the negative resolution procedure and would come into effect on the 6th of April 2024. The proposed rule would update fixed instalment repayment rates for student loans and will provide for an annual rather than a monthly calculation for Northern Ireland borrowers who live and work overseas and who have not provided the required information to the student loan company about their income. This will allow the student loan company to calculate the level of debt for these Plan 1 borrowers, thus bringing this aspect of the loan debt arrangement in Northern Ireland in line with changes in England and Wales 2024-2025. Members have any questions or points they wish to make on this one? If not, then we can move to consideration. Uh, so I would propose, members, that the committee has considered a proposal by the department to make a statutory rule. The Education Student Loan Repayment Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2024, and that we agree that it is content for the department to make that rule. Are we content? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, we'll then move to item number seven, Department First Day Briefing Part 3. Just we advise members that we'll now receive an oral and written first day briefing from the Department for the Economy. And you will wish to consider the clerk's cover note at page 32 and in the tabled items. This refers to 10X, City and Growth Deals, the Draft Tourism Strategy and Energy. And if we'll invite officials to come forward. Paul and Richard, you're very welcome. So members, we are delighted to be joined by Paul Grocott, who is the head of Economic Strategy Group at the department, and Richard Rogers, who is the head of the Energy Group. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome, and the committee very much look forward to working with you both, and thank you for, for providing us with first day briefs. If you're content, I can hand over to you if you wish to make an uh, opening statement, and then I'm sure members will have some questions. Yeah, so thanks, everyone. Um, delighted to be here. Um, most of you have met me over the past few years. I'm Richard uh, Rogers. Um, I've been just over five years um, as Deputy Secretary Head of Energy in, uh, in the Department of the Economy. The energy team itself these days is now 145 strong um, and its focus is on delivering the energy strategy in the context of the Climate Change Act and I would say it, I'd said that it's a good mixture of public policy officials, people who have got good experience in developing public policy and enabling legislation and also energy experts. So um, to turn immediately to the energy strategy, our focus is on delivering the energy strategy and it's best described as aiming to deliver self-sufficiency in affordable renewable energy and that means that and actually we have the, the potential eventually to export excess renewable energy as a benefit to the local economy we're going to stop importing fossil fuels eventually and we will break the link between our energy cost and global global commodity prices it's just terrible that when 
Russia invaded the Ukraine, gas prices spiralled, and we had to pay the price, paid the price all over our cost of living. And if we get this right, we'll pay a fair price for the, the energy we produce locally, and we will break the link with global commodity prices, and that price will be stable because the fuel itself tends to be free, and it's about the capital employed, and it's a stable cost over decades. That's what we're going to try. That's what we are trying to achieve. Um, if we can achieve a stable price for the renewable energy we produce locally, we can then eradicate fuel poverty. People still die in their homes in the winter time through cold-related illnesses. We've been lucky again this winter so far. There's, it's been mild, but it's wrong in a modern society like ours that people die of uh, cold-related illnesses in the winter. And then finally, the net zero technology solutions that we need to enable this renewable energy revolution is a fantastic opportunity for our economy because the rest of the world need these solutions. And so we're already seeing evidence of the solutions we're producing locally are great performing great export markets for us. Our Minister has been very clear since he arrived um, recently on his initial priorities, and they include increasing energy efficiency, uh, urgent action on delivering 80 per cent renewable electricity by 2030, the socialisation of electricity connection costs, strengthening community benefit for the renewable energy projects that we develop, a ban on fracking and petroleum licensing, and establishing a net zero accelerator fund. The important thing too is that it's not just for economy to deliver the energy strategy, but it really truly needs to be collaborative. Um, and we work very closely in particular with communities, infrastructure and DERA on the <coughs> delivery of the energy strategy. And then final comment would be that we have tried to ensure we have the discipline of, of publishing an action plan for each year. We did that for 2022 and 2023. The 24 one publication is imminent, and we also produce a report each year. We have produced reports on the 22 and 23 outcome to try and give visibility to the public, public at large. So I'll hand over to Paul, who will expand on the economic strategy. Just can to be maybe do some questions on the energy, and then we'll go to you, Paul. You oh, yeah, of course, yeah. No problem at all. Uh, thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, do you have any legislative plans to bring an energy bill to the assembly? Yeah. So the energy bill itself will have to be divided up. It's complex, it's long, <coughs> and so it will be in bite-sized chunks. I mean, there, there has been so much energy legislation um, done in London, in the Parliament in London, the Energy Security Bill started off as now the Energy Bill, and a lot of what we need here in the devolved space can be seen as already happened in, in GB, um, and indeed has already happened on the near, neighbouring jurisdiction down south. So we do need to bring legislation forward. We will have to do it, you know, prioritise with things like uh, enabling the utility regulator to work on, on energy decarbonisation is something we have to do quite quickly. So um, we will try and make the most of the next three years to, to bring forward bits and pieces to enable what I described. When can the committee expect that first piece of legislation? So, and on the, on the, for example, the utility regulator of IRAs, we would hope that that would happen this year. Will the department be seeking accelerated passage on any of that legislation? Um, well, that will be that will depend on how urgent it is. So you know, it, it's it's it, you know, if if um, it might be necessary, um, but it, it wouldn't be wrong to go into specifics right no now. No problem. And just finally, from me, uh, in the first day brief, uh, obviously the minister received a briefing uh, from officials in relation to RHI. Uh, the copy of that provided to the committee was pretty heavily redacted. Is there a reason for that? Um, I'm not sure what the reason would be for that. Um, I mean, I think the minister went on the record last week on, on BBC and talked back about the direction of travel in RHI. Um, won't go into the history of RHI, but everybody around the table will be aware. Um, it is a failed policy. It hasn't delivered the renewable heat um, that it intended to. It's there's been available resource to invest in renewable heat solutions and we haven't had access to it because we've it's been stopped since 2016 so the minister made it very clear that we do need to urgently resolve RHI that's a real focus for the people in the team and um, we would expect a paper to come to the executive uh, quite soon on that um, if you could just maybe come back to the committee in relation to why the information provided to us was redacted. Um, obviously, if there is to be legislation, it will come before this committee, and I'm sure the committee will want to take its time to deliberate over that. Uh, Mr Nesbitt. Chair, Chair, thank you very much, Paul and, and Richard. Good morning. Um, 
In terms of the actual strategy, which was published in December 2021, Richard, I think we've been here before. On page 26, there's a table of estimated capital investment and savings starting in 2021. <clears throat> and the net, the total investment, I am working out at about 1.222 billion, uh, with savings about 301 million. How, how much of the 1.222 billion has been invested per annum since 2021? Well, the interesting thing uh, about energy is that most of the investment is done by consumers, whether it's business consumers or householders. So the decisions that we make every day at home are around investment and not, you know, for example, when an oil boiler or a gas boiler breaks down, what do we do next? So it's well documented that we are slow in the decarbonisation of heat and we expect to have a consultation coming out um, in, the, in the coming months on the future supports for heat decarbonisation and obviously that's in the context of RHI. So we are behind on heat decarbonisation in the context of the 2021 document, but we're still making progress on renewable electricity where we're uh, in a range of 45 to 50 percent renewable electricity and investment continues in renewable electricity. Again, that's not as fast as it needs to be. We need urgent action if we're going to get to 80% by 2030. And we need, a, we need to put in place the support scheme that provides both the, the support for investment and the support for consumers. Um, you know. Okay, but the, the, these investments, which were indicative, uh, were across transport, energy supply, and buildings. Yeah. And, and what I'm looking for is the actual figures. How much was invested in 2021? How much was invested in 2022? How much was invested? Certainly, we could come back to the to the committee with an estimate of how much I don't have those figures to hand this morning. Um, Should you not have a rough idea in your head at this stage? Yeah, I mean, the focus is not on that absolute number. Richard. The focus is on the outcomes. So, for example, how many electric vehicles we see on the road, and the evidence is there that you know consumers are buying electric vehicles. So. Yeah, it's for for a question. Come back with the numbers for you, Mike. Okay, because you know, without the investment in capital, we can't deliver yeah. no, the strategy. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sorsha. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Richard. Lovely to, to see you today. Um, the Energy Skills Audit was published on the twenty second of June last year. The action plan noted that there would be the implementation of a plan based on the findings of the audit. Does the plan exist, and what are the next steps in it? And do we know how many people in each industry or job? Will be required to achieve the net zero plan. Yeah, so um, yeah, the plan exists, and we've established a cross departmental working group, and it's cro across our department and across other departments. Um, it's um, it's this is always going to be a work in progress, and the investment in skills, um, both um, in terms of courses at further education college, where the focus will be, and also in um, life in, in apprenticeships in, in the private sector. So. There's significant progress has been made, for example, in a cross-industry uh, work done between, for example, NIE, Northern Ireland Electricity, mm -hmm. and NI Water, where the skill set is, is broadly similar. Um, and so we have a joint utility mm -hmm. apprenticeship is, is being set up, um, and that's an outcome of the, the, the skills audit that was done last year. So yes, there is progress being made, but like everything, we, we need to do it faster. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a wee bit more about the Net Zero Accelerator Fund? Who's responsible for it um, and how will it operate? So, um, it's back to the point I was asked earlier about th there is a lot of capital to be invested and a lot of that capital will be invested by business and it'll be business and new ideas. So the idea of the Net Zero Accelerator Fund is that if the market fails, if, it's not, if the investment is not, um, it cannot be achieved by normal investment, like for example through banks and institutions, and through, through debt, then government could support through the Net Zero Accelerator Fund the investment. So the Net Zero Accelerator Fund has been taken forward by the Strategic Investment Board along with the department and the strategic outline case demonstrated the need and we're currently working through the outline business case to, to put in place the Net Zero Accelerator Fund and it will be a mix of equity and debt investment by government through government funding in uh, Net Zero technology. Timeline for that? Yeah, well, again, everything is urgent, but yeah, we're working on that now in, in this in this coming financial year. Yes. One last one, Richard. Um, can you outline the impact on investment of not having the business incentives here in the north um, that we do in the rest of the UK in terms of renewable energy? Um, 
progress is stagnant in the renewable heat and, and we don't you know we, we do need um, capital support for example for heat pump technology you know heat pump technology is advancing rapidly some of the examples that's happening across in GB are really really good we can, you know now the technology is able to do a lot better um, if you take uh, heat in a home where it might take 12,000 kilowatt hours of natural gas or heating oil to heat a home with a heat pump it only needs 4,000 kilowatt hours so that's a big part of the energy efficiency story. The fact is we don't have a heat pump base. We are manufacturing heat pumps in Northern Ireland, for example, at Octopus Energy Red in Mid-Ulster. They're all being sold in GB through Octopus Energy. Um, Glen Dimplex are, now, are, are, are also manufacturing heat pumps, but they're not being sold here. So the lack of a capital support scheme to actually do with the value, you know, the, the, we're talking about seven, eight, nine thousand pounds of capital support in GB is not available here. That's why we need to get on with this, and it's really frustrating for us that we know what we need to do, but we need to do it faster. And now that the Assembly is back and the Executive's back, we've got the potential to be able to do the legislation that's required to make these things happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Sir so David. Just following on from that, Richard, I love to meet your guys uh, as well. Uh, I, I totally welcome the 80% target in 2030. When, whenever I've read these papers in the last couple of months, or a couple of weeks, it's like plucking figures and putting dates to it rather than an actual target that we're going to, to achieve. And I, I worry that we've, we've plucked a, a, a nice soundbite rather than actual what, what can be delivered. And, and I want to see that delivered and I want to see us actually exporting energy. But is, is the legacy of RHI holding this back? No, I, I don't think the legacy of RHI is holding back the, um, the renewable electricity aspect. Um, the renewable electricity um, needs a support scheme. We consulted on the support scheme, but we need the legislation now to implement the support scheme. And the support scheme is effectively an, an analogy of what's happening across the water and down south. So the support scheme that we need here needs to be put in place and it needs the legislation to be put in place, and it's a contract for a different approach. Okay, so I have a, I have a constituent in, uh, uh, that, I, uh, that I met recently who want to farm, want to diversify, want to put in a biogas thing, and they can't access the banks. So it's one thing to say you can access the banks, but banks don't lend you any. So the only way the bank will guarantee, or is with a guarantee of some form of, of revenue, that then we can actually hit towards 80%, because the banks aren't lending money. So the, the problem is you need to, we need to be able to access the debt markets, to be able to accelerate this to meet 80%? Yeah, you, you make an absolutely fair point. Yeah. B businesses with strong balance sheets are able to borrow to do this work, and actually the return is good. The return is good in wind, and the return is good in solar. It's slightly more challenging than biomethane, but that's what you know. That's where the work with DERA and the po agriculture policy will help support that. But we can do the investment in wind turbines, we can do the investment of r solar on roofs without the capital support. It will help, however, for businesses, for example, who don't have a strong balance sheet and also for householders. But householders can today invest. That's why we need to look at other things like socialising connection policies, so because when people need additional voltage on the grid, they shouldn't be penalised for being the first mover. So all this needs to come together and as a matter of urgency. My next question was around that grid connection, so you've answered that there off. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard. In your in your presentation, you, you, you talked about the Climate Act, and that's obviously a huge umbrella looming over all the departments in terms of, of the Climate Act and the work that they're doing. Key to the Climate Act, or key component of it, is the just transition. Uh, so, I mean, can I maybe ask, in terms of the work of the Department for the Economy with regard to the energy strategy and even upscaling, uh, you know, just transition is going to be vitally important. So, you know, you're talking about incentive schemes. That's obviously important for the consumer, particularly those less well off. But there's also a component of of transition and maybe employment opportunities or skills or jobs. So, so if you could just outline what the department is doing in terms of acknowledging and working to within the just transition principles. Yeah. So, I mean. <laughs> I'm certainly on the record to say that um, you know the, the the regulatory environment here in Northern Ireland has succeeded, whereas it hasn't succeeded in the rest of the UK. We retained the regulatory environment whenever the rest of the UK was charging down the path of competition. Competition hasn't 
helped energy consumers across in GB, but so we retain the, the, the regulation here. And that's an example of how we need to persist on the regulatory protection. It's the regulatory protection that will provide the environment for a just transition to ensure that consumers are protected. And inside that regulatory environment today, for example, there is the Sustainable Energy Program, which has been running for the best part of 20 years. These days it spends eight million pounds of electricity consumers' money. It has the potential to do more. But the focus of that money is not on the able to pay, the people who can afford to do the inter interventions, but the people who cannot afford to pay. And that's a good example of what we're already doing, which will be part of the just transition going forward. In terms of skills, we're working closely with our skills colleague and the colleagues in the department about the, the courses that need to be lined up and joined up across all the further education colleges to ensure no matter where you live, it's not a postcode lottery. And I absolutely welcome the concept of regional rebalancing to ensure that we don't do things that are just Belfast or East-centric, that, that there is such an opportunity here because so much of our renewable resource is rural-based. It's only fair that, that rural, those rural economies benefit from it. So, for example, there is a great initiative, actually, of a farmer who has invested dramatically, turned over the past decade from dairy farming to renewable energy to the production of rapeseed oil products out in Castle Derg in, in, in Tyrone. And that concept has the potential to be of the heart of a just transition where the rural community can be providing the energy in a heat network to the local community, for example, in Castle Derg. That heat ne network would be regulated to ensure that people pay a fair and stable price and the excess is not there and the greed is not there. That's the kind of focus, to, to my mind, it's the proper regulatory environment. But you're right, I mean, uh, we need to get on with the Climate Change Act delivery because actually we're in the second year now of the carbon, first carbon budget. So the targets, point is well made, we need to be achieving targets this year. And that's why the Climate Action Plan that's been developed, led by DERA, where we own the energy production supply piece, has got to have real life proposals that we're doing, not just ideas. And just, uh, you, you also talked about working with other departments uh, i mean i know we, we had a debate early on in the assemblies about planning i mean i, I can imagine planning and other issues than, that are relevant to other departments are going to have an impact on the work that you're doing so maybe if you could outline some of the challenges uh, across other departments that, that we need to see movement on to help achieve the work that you're doing and then my last question is just i mean obviously onshore wind is vitally important offshore wind uh, potentially just as important so maybe some uh, detail some of the progress with regard to offshore wind. So just to turn quickly to the, the plan and the plan is particularly <coughs> relevant for onshore wind at the moment and there, there needs to be a presumption that we need the interesting thing there's a, at the moment a complete disconnect from the targets that, that this assembly agreed in the Climate Change Act and, and actually the planning regime to deliver them because actually it's totally disconnected and the presumption in the planning regime is that we make it as difficult as possible for renewable energy projects to, to, be, to, to get off the ground. And that cannot prevail, otherwise we certainly will miss the targets. So we, need, we do need um, the concept of permitted development rights, the concept uh, we need to have protection to ensure that, it, that, it, that, it, that, you know, that the landscape is protected, but we know what we need to do. We need two and a half gigawatts of new renewable capacity onshore before 2030. We're not going to get it at the current pace. So that is the real theme of this morning. We really need urgency. <coughs> offshore, we're making significant progress. The Crown Estate are really engaged with us. And we have, um, we're working to the Offshore Renewable Electricity Action Plan that is published. Um, we're expecting the results of the habitats, the, the strategic uh, um, environmental assessment and habitats <coughs> assessment to be to be available in the first half of this year, and that will establish what the real potential is in the sea. There's real, there, there's such significant potential, but all of that is from 2030. The targets for 2030 of 80% are now, and that has to be done through onshore. And the offshore is the real economic opportunity, the opportunity to get involved in sustainable aviation fuels and green maritime fuels, and for us to become, for, for this region to become the centre of a net zero technology uh, Klondike, if you like. Um, it's back to the future. It's like what this place was like back in the 1890s. You know, it's the engineering skills that we had then and the innovators that we had then that we, that we have here today, and we just need to open up that potential. Thank you. Thanks for it. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, Gary. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. And just on the back of Phillips, uh, the question I had was around planning as well. One of the frustrations over the years that I've heard from renewable energy companies is the frustration around the planning process. Obviously, there's the issue of lack of incentives, but you know people, unfortunately, are taking their money elsewhere and investing in other places, or certainly that's what they, they tell us. Um, one of the things that has been brought to my attention from, from some of these um, people over the years is the need possibly now at this stage for the likes of a task force to specifically uh, bring those departments together uh, and, and obviously for action in terms of trying to meet that 80% target. What are your thoughts? Is there a need for a task force or, or how does the departments specifically work together to try and address some of these well, issues? We are working together. So for example, the delivery of the energy strategy is clearly cross-departmental and the Department of Infrastructure is represented on that. So that, that goes without saying that needs to continue to happen. The, the community, the community aspect of this is really important. If you get community engagement, if you get community benefit coming from an investment, then you're more likely to get planning approval faster. So uh, there is a real opportunity because we now can operate in a dynamic energy environment where demand and supply is being balanced dynamically. Because we've got, we, we will implement smart meters and we will know what the energy looks like. Then there's a real opportunity. It's not like the last century. There's an opportunity now to say, if you're producing energy in your locale, in your community, you should see a benefit from that. You should see a benefit through your charges. And that's something we really need to urgently explore in terms of the future of the grid and the charging for the grid. Because people who produce the energy, in my mind, should see the benefit of that in their local area. That's the community benefit. Mm -hmm. In the past, there's been ideas like it'll be a community hall or a community sports ground. But actually, in reality, if everybody in the area was able to get some benefit in their energy, electricity prices, then there's likely to be more community buy-in. So that's the kind of thing we need to do urgently, and that will help, I hope, in the planning aspect as well. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. But in terms of getting that community buy-in, like I see right across my constituency an increase in these energy um, battery storage facilities. There's real scepticism and a nervousness in terms of you know what the what these mean. But the same applies to other renewable energy um, sources as well. So how do you get that community yeah, buy-in? Well, look. Than, yeah. Communication is everything. Yeah. You know, the, the, if we're going to have behavioural change, it's all about the proper communication. And there's a really good example of it in the Geo Energy Project, Geo Energy NI, um, the heat beneath your feet. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're we're in a we're in a demonstrator stage where we're doing the, the shallow wells here in Stormont, subject to planning approval, which hopefully will arrive <laughs> early next month from the City Council. But there's also the deep well concept at Caffrey at Greenmount in, in, in County Antrim, and that's a two and a half kilometre well. Now, there's been a, we, we at the outset on that, it's not just an engineering project, it's actually, it's actually about what can be the benefit of this. And people are talking about geoenergy, and we haven't produced any in it yet, but mm. because we've done the communication properly, so I think the point you make is that, or you're, you're getting at, is that if we communicate better, then we'll get better acceptance. We need to help people understand because they want to know what to do. They want to know do they make their next vehicle an electric vehicle. They want to know do they have a heat pump. So we need to communicate better across government. People need to see the benefit in their pockets. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's one of the frustrations. When we're, you know, there seems to be a lot of uh, money being spent, and rightly so, in terms of getting to that stage. But people need to obviously see the benefits. So thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for, for the update. Um, I, I mean, I agree with, with everybody, what they've said around um, the, the table here, and I think planning ha has a big role to play in it. And I suppose um, what, what I feel is that there, we're still working in those silos in, in terms of the overall target. So we have a climate target, um, but we're still working at different paces. Um, within within um, within government in order to reach that and the prioritisation you know maybe from one minister is not cross cutting to to the others and and we need to really close that gap so um, is there a way that you you said about the legislation and it's complex is there a way of bringing forward legislation you know, bit by bit, so that we can reach some of those, you know, that the, those targets become clear, 
um, and that everybody buys into it. And um, is there some quick actions that we can bring forward in terms of energy inefficiency? You know, there is a commitment by the, the minister to, to um, you know, to, to end the importing of fossil fuels. But many of our homes are using coal still, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's homes in the most deprived areas that are using these inefficient um, fuel, this inefficient fuel and it's driving air pollution within it and then the, they're in homes that are inefficient as well uh, and there's no retrofit program so it's, it's very very complex in terms of how do we drive efficiencies and we can, don't always have to you kind of wait on, on, on uh, the perfect environment we can actually work at energy efficiency on the ground in individual people's homes um, in and around how their energy is thing I know a, a kind of broad planning and, and, and communities and, uh, and homes all in date but it is very much connected yeah so uh, I'll, I'll not go back <laughs> to, to the legislation please except to say that yeah we do need to bring it forward bit by bit um, we've talked quite a lot to all the parties about um, a flagship multi-year energy efficiency program and it has absolutely broad political support because that program could inform people who can afford to take to pay for the interventions to know what to do and for the capacity to be in the industry to do the work it can also provide the support 100 percent grant support at times to the people who cannot afford it the vulnerable it can also take young people who are not in employment and education and training today <coughs> and train them up to do the interventions on a local community basis. So a multi-year flagship and energy efficiency is really important. The big question is, it has to be multi-year and we have to be able to pay for it. And when we look across the border, we, got a, yeah. we, we are an envy at the fact that they raise levy to fund these things and they're spending hundreds of millions of euros in this very thing. But it means that whenever people go to the petrol pumps to fill their <coughs> car with petrol and diesel, a percentage of what they pay, a certain cents per litre of what they pay, is used then to fund these energy efficiency interventions. So we need to be really brave and think about how do we raise money on heat and oil, on natural gas and on petrol and diesel, maybe or certainly on the import of heat and oil into the country, for example, to be able to fund these interventions because, as we know, there is a budget crisis and the money is not going to be readily available. But we are not going to get far enough in tackling the real poverty in rural homes, where homes are really in, in, inefficient unless we have the money to support the interventions and the, the, the ability to do it. So <coughs> that's really important. And, and again, our minister has made it clear that energy efficiency is top of the list on, on, on his priorities in energy. And there's great talk at the minute about a poverty strategy, but that actually really plays right into okay, that yeah. and supporting and supporting that and it's back to what Gary has, has has said earlier on about you know um, would there be uh, any merit in having a really focused task force working at, at that level those strategic levels right across and and if you look at the Republic of Ireland as well their planning laws are very much deeper you know you will not build a house that is this, you know heat inefficient yeah. Yeah. Um, it just won't happen it, it, it has to be completely and we're still building to old regulations and actually building houses that are inefficient while we have these ambitious targets in front of us so there is a complete disconnect between departments whilst you say you're communicating you're not working in silos but the results are telling us that we're not working together Thank you. Do you want another point, Mike? Do you mind just a, a follow-up on, yeah. on St Aids? In the 2022 Action Plan, Action 7 was an area-based energy efficiency pilot scheme focused specifically on domestic dwellings. How did that work out, Richard? Well, you know it didn't because we didn't have the money to do it. Right. So how, how many of the, the actions in the 2022 plan fell of the 20? Well, it's, it's in the report. I don't know the exact number. It's in the action plan report for 2022. That was published okay. a year ago. Yeah. Jonathan? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and Richard, thanks for your presentation this morning. And it's good to see you all bit virtually. Um, I suppose probably the members have really encapsulated my key concerns. You know, a really ambitious target of 80% by 2030 in terms of renewable energy but others would say completely unrealistic given the challenges that it faces. You've touched on the two points in particular that the energy uh, sector have come to me with concerns and indeed other members. 
particularly planning. Uh, it's a huge concern. And as Philip McGuigan said, we did have a debate on that uh, earlier on uh, in the first week, actually, of the return of devolution. And one of the key points was the huge concerns regarding uh, renewable energy uh, applications and their delay in the system, some waiting for years uh, before a PSE hearing, in particular large uh, wind farm applications, which are going to be vital and to enable us to meet that target. So probably just to reinforce, and I'll, I'll not put you over the game, but just to reinforce the need for synergies across the departments uh, if we are going to reach that target. And you've you've mentioned how that is maybe happening, but I would say that there's much needed urgency through, uh, across the system of government to ensure that we can meet that. The other one that you could maybe perhaps uh, develop on is the other con key concern is the lack of incentives uh, towards those that wish to partake uh, and uh, in um, renewable energy schemes. When they compared across their colleagues in different parts of these these eyes, they, they feel left behind. Um, have you any way in which the department are keen to try to get across to alleviate those concerns to the industry that you know Northern Ireland is a place that is uh, fit for purpose in terms of investment in renewable energy, given the lack of investments, because many believe that we're still hiding in the shadows of RHI. So, uh, two key um, incentives that are required uh, from a specific energy perspective. One <coughs> is on renewable electricity, and we consulted on the design scheme last year, and we will publish the high-level design of that scheme in the coming uh, weeks um, and that will give a direction of travel and that's that scheme that support scheme is really important because it, it does two things it provides one um, a floor a guarantee of income for the investor which is fair it's the fair price and we that's <coughs> the biggest challenge for us because there's an expectation that that fair price is higher than it would have been three years ago and that isn't fair on consumers here. Yes, it will be higher because costs are higher, but to say that it's higher because gas prices are higher is not acceptable because the wind isn't any more expensive. So it has to be fair, and it has to be a fair incentive to allow people to invest, but it also has to be fair for consumers because it provides, if you like, a guarantee for consumers that that is what you will pay. So let's say it's six pence a kilowatt hour. That means if the market delivers 8p because of the gas price, then the, the, the operator pays back. If the market delivers 5p, then we pay as consumers. So it's a fair, stable price. So that high level design of that will be published in the coming weeks. On heat, I mentioned it already, uh, Jonathan, that um, we're behind on heat, but the expectation is that we will consult on a heat support scheme in, in the coming months. I would hope it would be out before Easter, but if it's not Easter, it'll be by the end of April, where we will have a consultation on heat support, but we're way behind because effectively the support <coughs> ended in 2016. It ended with just 2,000 boilers having been installed and the rest is history, and it's not acceptable. We are doing, we are making progress in the switch, for example, from oil to gas, and um, the gas, for example, in Dungannon since November, mm -hmm. all the gas is net zero gas because it's been produced from waste, waste, vegetable waste from supermarkets and from restaurants at Grand Valico Park in Dungannon. And all the gas in Dungannon this winter has been biomethane. It's a net zero gas, it's not a natural gas. And that represents great progress, and that can be replicated across the region. And the plan the report that came out from Queen's last year already <coughs> indicates that a fifth of our gas that we use today could be provided by biomethane, which is back to support the rural economy and the farming economy. But it's not enough. You know, we do need this heat support scheme mm -hmm. and it's been eight years and I can't defend the fact that it's been eight years except to say that we're working on the new scheme now and we'll be consulting on it in the coming weeks. No, that, that's, that's helpful. Thank you, Richard. And particularly, actually, just maybe to follow on in relation to solar uh, grants, um, you know, this is something now that's really in motion in the Irish Republic in particular, uh, which is actually attracting huge investment and indeed, you know, not just in the Republic of Ireland, but beyond looking to get in, uh, involved with it. We have huge potential here in Northern Ireland, even when we look at our housing executive stock, for example, to really do targeted schemes to try to, to show the worth of renewable, to try to reach these 80% targets. H have we any follow-ons from that particular conversation? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel potentially for potential investors that are looking at solar as, as an option? 
Yeah, and, and it, as you indicated, solar stands on its own feet. It doesn't need support. It just needs the right information, and that's where the communications are really important. So in the energy management strategy for central government, which was uh, published, uh, agreed, and then published in 2019, agreed by the Northern Ireland Civil Service Board, we have been implementing that, and that is effectively the public housing, the public uh, building stock is actually investing in capital projects to reduce the revenue costs. And uh, by the end of this year, we've invested upwards of 45 million, in particular in the health service, in hospitals like, like the Royal Victoria, and in uh, NI Water, where they've got a significant solar PV and battery project. And that is taking the pressure off the revenue budgets because it's reducing, it's a stable energy cost going forward, and it's reducing both their energy costs going forward and their footprint. So we are making real progress, for example, in the public housing st or the public building stock. But as you indicated, it's not enough. But the key to unlocking this is to be able to communicate better to householders to say, you can do this. It's affordable. You can get a payback in five or six years and the solar panels will last 20 years. So it's but it is I mean, there's a lot more evidence of solar on roofs across Northern Ireland. But we, we certainly could do better with better communication for that to happen faster. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Jonathan. Patrick? Yeah. Um, look, thank you for your presentation, Richard. I know we've met on, on numerous occasions so far, um, so it was really useful to, to hear that detail from, from other members, and, and I would concur with what's been said so far. I suppose that the largest issue that we get through the door in, in my office is around the cost of living. It's around what people are going through with their energy costs each and every day, um, and that's right from people who are, are struggling um, to put money on, on the meter and who are having to pay um, on that regular basis as opposed to people who can pay quarterly, monthly, whatever, um, right up to people who are locked out of those uh, schemes you know, for solar panels for, for investment. So um, as Sinead and Gary have, have both alluded to within our own constituency, th that kind of cycle of poverty is, is very, very difficult to break. Um, so it's, it's really positive to hear uh, your comments so far um, on, on putting money back in people's pockets. That for us is, is the key part of this. It, it's actually giving the consumer an, an investment and, and an ability to, to go beyond that. I think we also have to look at the, the macro scale in this. Um, obviously, as an island, uh, we have huge potential, as you've already alluded to, um, around energy, particularly as Philip has talked about for offshore energy as well. I'm wondering, like for constituencies like mine, um, you know, you have Loch Foyle, um, you're, you're very close to Donegal, there are those abilities there for, for us actually to, to be an innovator around that and actually for substantial offshore energy. So rather than us looking at this just um, within the government in the north, have there been conversations across the island on this and what opportunities are being explored for people right across Ireland to benefit from these schemes? Um, well. In, in terms of engagement with our neighbours, it's been very limited to date because the reality is they are charging on and they're not waiting for anybody and they've had a Green Minister and they're, they're driven through legislation and policy and, and we look and envy at what's happening. But from our perspective here, I mean the future, this is the third revolution in energy. You know, ultimately we, we, do, we started by importing coal and so on and the first revolution was central heat <coughs> in, the, in the 60s if you like and the second revolution was gas. And so we've got infrastructure that's really useful there. We've got wires that are going to need a couple of billion pounds of investment over the next decade, and that's subject to the regulatory scrutiny that the, that for, for, uh, on NIE as the monopoly. We've got the gas network, which ultimately will either flow biomethane or it'll certainly not be flowing natural gas eventually. But some of it will flow biomethane, and some of it will be a storage for energy to keep the lights on when the wind doesn't blow. The third major infrastructure investment is going to be in heat networks. So you take somewhere like the foil. The foil, there is enough heat in the foil to provide heat into a heat network for the whole region in the northwest. And that can be done through the investment in insulated pipes over a 40 to 50 year period. And so the legislation and the regulatory environment that's required for heat networks will is coming forward. Uh, we need to finalise it here, to pull on what's already been done in Westminster, and that will provide the foundation to be able to start, for companies to start to invest in heat networks, networks in a regulated environment, so that we have a stable price for producing heat from water sources to supply cities and towns. That's part of the town solution, alongside biomethane and alongside 
re uh, renewable wind. And, and I think you've already mentioned in, in detail the earlier questions as well about um, how far advanced we are in the south in, in terms of these conversations. Um, while obviously we would prefer to be in that position and, and further down the line, I do see strengths in that because we have partners who we can work quite closely with and learn a lot from. So in terms of that, how do we expedite that conversation to make sure that we are catching up at pace with what's happening in the South? Well, we, we and, and have been chastised a little for the talk about collaboration, and the reality is, however, that collaboration is the only way forward, learning from each other and working together to make things happen. Uh, we've done a lot of engagement with uh, Desnes in London, um, and that's linked to um, UKRI and Innovate UK, where we believe we reached far more money than we've ever done before into research and innovation here with in, in companies developing net zero technology here. Um, we've had significant engagement with DEC in Dublin. We have formal we have a formal engagement through the joint steering group, which was set up for the single electricity market, but can be expanded to the whole renewable energy side. And we've had significant engagement with the Strategic Energy Authority for Ireland, who oversee all of the delivery of the support schemes. And in effect, we need to learn from that to be able to do it here. But at the heart of all this, support needs the finance to make it happen. And it can't be one year on one year otherwise, like I explained to Mike earlier, it doesn't happen then. Absolutely. Looks like you for your and then Jeanette. Just one wee question, uh, and you've talked about it quite a bit about regulation. And uh, is it time that we again, once again, looked at the utility regulator and um, their remit, uh, and maybe perhaps widen the scope so that we that it's it's facing into what's currently happening as opposed to. Uh, as yes, opposed well, to look, you, you, absolutely yes. So you take for example Sony, who are the monopoly system operator for electricity. What we will need here quite quickly is, a, is an energy system operator, not just an electricity system operator. That energy system operator will be, will be regulated by the regulator. The utility regulator will regulate all of energy. We will have integrated power, heat and transport. All the energy we produce locally will be regulated by the regulator. So therefore, the remit has to be ex extended. How soon can that happen? Well, initially, that... initially <laughs> there will be the extension of the virus that we talked about that's quite urgent now. But it will be part of the energy bill, will be to extend the specific powers in specific areas of the regular to be able to provide the protection for consumers and what are long term infrastructure investments. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, when did you say the RHI paper was going to the executive? I, I didn't say when, I said it, it, it's something that the, the Minister is committed to doing. Problem. And is there any indication of costs associated with the business case at this stage? On, on RHI? Mm -hmm. um, well, RHI has always been funded by annually managed expenditure, Amy. And as everyone is aware, we, we have underutilised Amy and it's lost forever. But however, there is Amy going forward. So once we can resolve the RHI scheme, there is the order of 30 something million pounds a year that can go towards heat support. That's why we need to urgently resolve RHI, because then we can access that. We haven't been able to access it because we haven't resolved RHI, so we need to get on with this urgently. No problem, Clark, could you summarise? Uh, I think Chair, we'll beat that to the end, if that's no okay, problem. Chairperson. Yeah. And, uh, no no problem. Problem. Okay, okay, on that one then, Mr Grocog, you're very welcome, sir. Um, hand over to you to give an opening statement, if you're okay. content. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Committee, um, you're well into everything, but congratulations on appointment of the chair and there's uh, some new members as well. <coughs> so congratulations on you that to join it. Uh, so I head up our economic strategy group. I've been in post from October 2020. So worked closely with many members uh, since then. We provided a briefing to supplement the first day brief. Um, so you'll see we've got five divisions in the department. So at a high level, we cover sort of strategy, sort of across the whole department, uh, individual policy areas like innovation and research, tourism, social enterprises are in there. We also have program delivery um, responsibilities, so that's most notably visible through our city deals investments and also the telecoms, uh, stratum and gigabit. And then finally, we've got the partnership relationship with three of the um, arms length bodies and also Tourism Island as the cross-border body. So <coughs> that's invest, and we've got the conversation later on about invest, but also uh, TNI uh, and then NI screen as well was in, is within uh, our role. There is, uh, well, it's obvious within the briefing we provide, and the stuff we're going to talk about here is strong alignment, what the Minister presented as his priorities from one day in the work that we do. Um, so, very keen to work with the committee um, as we develop those priorities. Or that, you know, personally, we find it very useful that sort of the scrutiny, challenge, and accountability that we get from the committee is really useful as we develop and implement policy. So, 
Um, happy to take questions, what we've provided, uh, and I'm really looking forward to working with members over the next number of years. Perfect, thank you very much. I'm, I'm on the far side of a cold, I'm sorry, so if, I'm a, if I sound a bit hoarse... Um, no, don't be worried at all. Me. Don't be worried, thank you very much. Uh, Sosha. Thank you, Chair, and um, hi, Paul, good to see you. Um, in terms of, you just mentioned there, the Minister's um, priorities, so good jobs, regional balance, productivity and decarbonisation. We have a very dairy-heavy committee here, so I'm going to make a pitch for Lagan Valley. Um, <laughs> I'm going to suggest that the utilisation of the lands at the Maze Long Cash site could provide the ideal launch pad to harness those goals. Um, we just spoke about energy and we're talking about the potential for jobs, the potential for growth, the fact that the North has to jump in to the opportunities that we have. I mean, Richard talked there about um, the new revolutions that we've come through. Um, so I just wonder, does that site play a role for the department in terms of viewing it as a strategic site, not just in terms of meeting those four um, targets that the minister has outlined, but also in terms of that crucial A1, M1 economic corridor that links the whole island. And just lastly, in terms of the FE delivery model, you, you'd mentioned there about programme delivery and stuff. Is there a timeline for that? Um, so on, um, on FE delivery, so, uh, that's not my um, brief, unfortunately. No, so not, so yeah. my, Moira would be the best place to brief you on that. So if, if you're happy enough, if the clerk writes to us, um, Moira's team can write back. I, I just, just, I'm not able to give you a, a, a decent answer on that, I'm afraid. That's uh, the person, not the village in your constituency. Uh, <laughs> Moira Doherty, thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> I didn't pick that up. Um, yeah, so certainly, I think on the. Um, it's just Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So burned up, I'm, I'm not on Phil Cylinders this morning. <laughs> I was sitting there putting paracetamols in, but yeah, just got that. <laughs> I think, so the utilisation of land is absolutely part of the approach. I think so. There's a um, maybe a bit of a conversation later on on the implementation of the action plan. So how Invest and I sort of delivers um, its approach to land is is going to be important. On uh, regional balance, the approach that we've taken up to now is so there's a consultation that we published. We're engaging with local councils to understand what their priorities are. Um, so the co-design is going to be important. There's no point in us imposing a top-down um, uh, policy prioritisation. So we want to understand look, where, the, where is the need for investment or support at a local level and how can we best place to organise economic policy around that. So I would expect... Um, from your constituency, the council areas, to be putting forward that as a viable asset. And then us, the job on us then is to position that strategically and think how do we develop something like a, um, a north-south corridor across that so A1, M1, uh, and then the investments that are required to capitalise on that. It, it's, it has to be rooted in strengths in places, aligned to the needs of those individual places as well. Like a, a one-size-fits-all isn't going to work on sub-regional balance, I don't think. Mm -hmm. In terms of the actual role there that you've talked about, obviously there is a role for strategic investment board and that MLK project does predominantly sit with the executive office but in terms of actually being strategic about investment across Northern Ireland um, has there been any conversations with SIB and your department on areas of land like that that could be utilised in a strategic way for the benefit of the Northern Ireland economy? Uh, so, so across the executive there's an investment plan that the obviously TEO owns and SIB um, uh, deliver on behalf of the executive so that that exists at a strategic level i'm not cited on anything specific about mlk but i can have a look at when i get back and um, absolutely we can write to the committee to see um uh, update you on on any specific conversations or the potential um therein yeah okay thank you okay. sticking with lag and valley and Sinead, i'm sure you'll want to Okay. <laughs> Actually, to be honest with you, um, I, I agree totally with Sorsha in, in the in the context of the TEO as well. I think the May site has um, been really underutilised, and I suppose it, it, it nearly personifies the dysfunctionality um, of, of this place. That you know, such an asset has been left uh, uh, unused and uh, unutilised for so long. So I absolutely uh, agree there. Um, I, I'm going back. Back to um, the, the, the vision set before um, us um, by the Minister in terms of um, his economic vision uh, and the good jobs, the productivity, the regional balance and, and, and decarbonisation. Some of these areas he can't deliver on his own. He needs wider support, uh, cross-cutting support from from from, from um, other departments. And we've just talked about um, <coughs> the energy and the climate change and the energy legislation and how it is cross-cutting uh, in government. 
How, how will you deliver regional balance without the support of other departments? Or what is the plan to get other departments to support it? Because the levers for the economy, for example, you need infrastructure, you need communities, and I would argue that you actually need health interventions as well, because you have to deal with things like economic inactivity, productivity, uh, and all of that. So what kind of mechanisms are you working towards in order to deliver on the objectives and the vision of the Minister? And will there be a pu push for the programme for government to have the same objectives in order to deliver that prosperity for, for, or, or for places left behind? And um, I'll let you go with that one first. There's okay. no other way. <laughs> So I think you could include all departments in your list. There's, <laughs> yeah, no, there's yeah. not, you know, there's a reasonable case for education, obviously, okay. uh, and I think, you know, justice in many cases, the people that are in the system, it's a failure of economic and social policy to support those people. So you'd yeah. want to be um, uh, supporting them. I think um, the challenge that we've got as officials, so the minister set out his strategic focus. This past week in our world, there's been assembling. Okay, well, what are the activities that deliver against them and fills out that framework and and. Um, the benefit of a minister is that now is now supercharged in terms of delivery. There's a real focus on getting stuff done over the next uh, 12 months and certainly over the next three and a bit years of the mandate. Um, those connections at individual action level and policy level will already exist, I suspect, in many areas, uh, and it's um, ensuring that they are uh, moving as quickly as possible. The second part of our job then is in the, in the strategic role that we have in the group is what's the, the architecture that goes around that to make sure that as a department we're as organised as possible but also that we're able to identify where those synergies and dependencies are with other departments and we're able to um, ensure that either at an official level or escalated to the minister at an executive level is able to make those representations. On whether it's um, uh, formation of a programme for government, I'm not cited on uh, what the executive's up to in that, I'm afraid, but certainly I, I would expect that our department, our minister, would represent these priorities as uh, integral to any delivery of a PFG. And I suppose it brings me to the next part of that question. 10x um, was the previous vision, and we're, we have lots of visions um, here. How, how do we make sure that we can carry this through, you know, this, the, the, this vision, uh, and how does it line up with 10x? And are all the arm's length bodies um, now focused in a new direction, or are they still focused in t uh, 10x and they're going to plug these the, the, these three objectives into the 10x um, as it currently or uh, previously existed yeah so um so the, the, the arms bodies are here to deliver the minister's priorities so everybody's absolutely focused on that i think you know as the ministers explained there was some good stuff happening under the sort of the previous branding of 10x <coughs> there's no intention to um to, to, to let off the pace on that good stuff. There is some reprioritization that's happened in terms of what's important to so regional balance, for example, is much more high profile than perhaps you would have seen in mm -hmm. uh, previous conversations. Um, so, the, as I said, the, the job of officials now is to say, okay, the minister set out this priority. This is how we deliver this quickly. Uh, and our arms and bodies are part of that family and sort of representing how do we, I mean, what's our contribution at individual um, organisation levels? So, for me, that's invest, screen, TNI, and on a cross border basis for TIA. What's the contributions of those organisations to delivering these priorities quickly? And that will look that, that will come together in something that looks a lot like a business plan for the department uh, and possibly over a, a longer period, over a three year plan where that's necessary. If there are, you know, some of this stuff is complicated, we are going to need milestones to deliver over that three year mandate. And what kind of measures would you put in place? Um, what <coughs> forms would you put in place to measure uh, regional equity? That's, so that's a job that we have to do, absolutely. So uh, what gets measured gets done is a true yeah. enough um, yeah. truism, I think. Um, so we're in conversations now with the minister. He's obviously assembled a group of advisers to provide advice. They'll play an important role. The committee will have a view, I'm sure. So we're, you know, we're happy to take a view from members of what's important to um, drive the types of activity that's reflective of the problems that you see. And like I mentioned, it's specifically on regional balance that has to be informed by what councils are telling us other problems. So in the northwest, um, it will be a different set of issues and priorities that um, are represented to us than in, say, the uh, mid southwest region, um, or even in Lagan Valley, for example. And we need to be able to accommodate that in the metrics, but also have something that's simple enough to drive behaviour across our DfE family. Okay. And will you be looking at health outcomes as part of regional balance in terms of the economy? Um, we can absolutely. We can look at that certainly. Um, 
Uh, I haven't seen anything recently from uh, here. I know from a, a while ago the Marmot study was quite influential over here in Britain. Um, but yes, yeah, happy to consider that and how we piece it together. Um, and you know, from an executive perspective, I would have been thinking that they're, they're, they're absolutely interested in that. And because this is so complex, <coughs> like energy uh, and like climate change, do you think legislation would be important in order to underpin it and so that every department has, has a target to, to reach? Because if every department didn't have the net zero target, we wouldn't be moving all together in the right direction. Yeah, I know you've asked the Minister the same question and he's happy enough to consider it. Um, uh, I think the concern he relayed to you was about the timing of legislation to get it through in the mandate, and, but it's, I think he was happy Vision enough to talk is going to take decades, yeah. so we, need to, we can't do this stop, stop, start and have different visions with different mandates. Yeah. This is a problem that will be solved and it'll, it'll take a long time, yeah, so we um, need to start in a, a legislative manner yeah. to do it. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Mike? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you. Um, if, if we go back to the Minister's vision statement last week, which I find very encouraging on a number of levels. One was this idea of perhaps clusters and specialist industries. So if we go back 100 plus years to when we were an economic powerhouse, it was built around shipbuilding, engineering, textiles, biggest rope works in the world, agriculture. But the um, regulatory and strategic environment then was probably a lot looser. So today, out of London, you've got city deals, you've got levelling up, potential enterprise zone, shared prosperity. You've got 10X, you've got an energy strategy, you're going to have uh, a tourism strategy. Does all that add up to constraints to making it work? Or, or is it an enabler? Um, so, so it's a fair comment that we're not for want of strategies. You know, and certainly the minister's early engagement with us is that there's, there's there really isn't any more need for strategic um, visioning. This is about delivery. So we've got that strategic focus across those four pillars. Um, I think you talked about like the complicated funding environment that's now integrated. You know, in addition to that, the Shen <laughs> Island funding and there's Peace Plus funding that's that's uh, in the mix. Um, the challenge and uh, is how you organise that. The benefit of having an industry focused is that it provides that um, strategic focus of if there is. Quite a significant amount of investment available to us. How do we ensure that that's invested in the right areas and the right strengths? And you know, um, so city deals is a good um, early indicator of where certain places have strengths. So, for example, in the northwest, there's particular strengths around robotics and analytics. In Belfast, deal there's an advanced manufacturing sector that's been implemented, and then there's similar areas of strengths. For example, up in Causeway, there's some interesting projects coming through on agri-food. So they provide as a, a an early indicator of where investment ought to be. Done directed to uh, and that I think is a good framework to ensure that we develop strengths in places that can um, work together rather than what we don't want is duplicative activity happening across the place. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if there's a tension between the industries we want to support and the support mechanisms and strategies particularly coming out of London that help. Um, some years ago as part of the executive office we, we went to Brussels and we met officials from the country which were the incoming presidents. And they said, what, what you do in the UK is you maybe are, are looking to build a road and you come to Brussels and you say, is there any money for roads? And Brussels says, no, we're doing bridges this year. So we go, oh, oh, there we go, we'll just pay for it ourselves. Whereas this country went to Brussels and said, what are you funding this year? And they would say, we're doing bridges. And they say, great, we'll be back in a week <laughs> with six bridges. And you know, so they, they were looking at the regulatory strategic framework and saying we will work to that rather than <coughs> does it help us with what we want to do. Yeah, so I think what helps mitigate against that is maybe focus on the technologies. So the underpinning technologies that are being applied in industries and sectors are broadly consistent across different places and that's what driving. So if you're, if you're interested in funding streams coming out of London or their own centre bodies, it's the technologies and the application of those technologies to industries that's important to them and that is embedded within our approach to industry um, uh, and those clusters and those sector plans. But the Minister thinks it's pretty complex and would rather it was simplified or certainly not added to in terms of... In what sense? In terms of more strategies and... Um, yeah, so it's about delivery, I think. So, you know, the st st strategies are great in that it gives you a shared sense of the problem. You get organised around a priority. Um, we've 
probably got enough of them, I think, Mike. It's, this is about having an impact in a way that we've not been able to do up to now. And I, listen, have to, as economic policymaker, I think I have to be honest about that, that we've just not, we've not had an impact in the way. So the minister sets out those four priorities. That's what we've got to get on and deliver against. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Jonathan? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Suppose sticking with the theme of parish pump politics, um, <laughs> it would be remiss of me not to mention city deals and the mid south west deal in particular, with some very exciting agri business energy related projects. Uh, I think that, given the previous conversation regarding the difficulties the agricultural sector are going to face and and the potential uh, part they can play in renewable energy. I think that's a very important project going forward. But could you outline the status uh, of the city deal projects at present? Uh, are, you, are you just interested, is it just the, in Mid-Southwest oh, that you're interested in or no, across no, the page? No, across, across <laughs> the board, obviously particular interest yeah. in Mid and South West, but just across the board, how are we progressing? Um, so we'll, we'll start with the parish pump, as you said, so that um, there's, there's heavy engagement and, and particular thanks to um, the Makers Alliance um, that has worked very closely with the Mid Southwest deal to understand what's the industry need, and that's that's led to the development of um, strategic outline cases for the projects in those areas. They will then move through into approvals of a, an OBC, and then we'll start to release funding um, across the piece. Obviously, there's just to zoom back out a little bit. There's four deals um, across the region. Uh, the Belfast uh, region deal is more advanced and. Um, Nearly all, if not all, of those are now at what we call contract for funding stage. So money has been released to develop those projects. You would have seen probably most recently uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Centre has recently got planning permission, so that is sort of progressing and the others are there. The other deals are slightly slow behind, but still progressing very well. So the, the, the Derry, City and Straban deal has outlined business cases in, in all places and we're just moving through the approvals of them. And then finally in the causeway, probably similar um, uh, position is the Mid-Southwest. They've got a clear idea of what their projects are. They're now moving through the process of defining <coughs> those and ensuring that there's industry buy-in to, um, um, I guess, give assurances and confidence to both the members of those council areas and also to the, the funders that there's a long-term future for these things, that they have that sort of game-changing impact that we believe that city deals can have. Given, given the, the slower nature in terms of the delivery and progress of city deals outside the Belfast region, uh, is there a particular concern that that money could be lost or, or reallocated or are they central to the minister's vision going forward? It's ring fenced funding, funding, Jonathan. So there's, there's, um, you know, the, the money is there to deliver that uh, against those projects. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Will. David. Thank you. I'm going to go pure parish, but the, uh, <laughs> just to, to, to follow on from, from Sorsha and, and actually Sinead, I totally absolutely agree. Sort of the maze side is that kind of microcosm of politics in Northern Ireland and the potential's all there and completely unrealised. But the, the access to that, and it's a wider point I want to make, but the, the access to that site is a private road that is past planning permission now, where a private developer will build a new road. And, and part of that has been selling the land or for housing beside it and part of a economic zone that the dev private developer will be in, in in control of. Now that is right at the maze, uh, right at the, sorry, Sprucefield, right at the other side of the motorway from Sprucefield, a completely strategic piece of land which is in the A1, M1 corridor. We talked yesterday about the all island rail review and, and the strategic nature of that. And Part of my concern with the with the you know advanced manufacturing and the green jobs and the and I totally welcome every strategy to do that is what that looks like in the ground and to me we've got lots of um, bits of land for economic land which are like Tesco or sorry they're like uh, little spars or or centres all over the place which focus on on local community and that they have a place and that's totally right but we don't have those mega stores mm -hmm. it, it, like the, the Tesco seems to be strategically placed. Uh, with large areas that are connected to the railway, to the to the to the to the motorway <coughs> connectivity, so we can we can take manufacturing straight on to major roads and major infrastructure rather than sp scattered around the countryside, if you like. So, I is there any plans that that site? I'm particularly talking about one, but this this will go right across the board. We were talking about regional balance out of Belfast, in you know to Derry or, or Tyrone or wherever. Is there plans to? to look at land, I know in my area there's nothing next to nothing left from Vest and I, for land, to look at strategic land and that form, to, to, 
to the government to take <coughs> or to, to take option on that we can then create those jobs and those skills and actually place them into our constituencies in that cluster model that the ministers. So the short answer is yes, absolutely. That's okay. um, probably better in the conversation that's coming up. So in the action plans, there's a, there's a specific action plan that we've included in the um, in the implementation of the lines review from Invest around land. So, you know, and, and Kieran will be able to talk to those those plans. But absolutely, it's a it's a key part of our economic delivery that, that we have to um, respond to. Hello, thank you, Chair. Across all the subjects we've covered today, uh, in terms of the design and making policies, you know, most of them have required uh, investment in the first instance. Uh, so I'm kind of just kind of asking in relation to uh, the potential for the Euros Casement Park. Uh, I, I don't only misquote, but I think I read somewhere yesterday that you know other another location had uh, for you know a, a substantial amount of money from tourism spend in the one week of the euros being there so i suppose can i ask that yourselves have you done any work in terms of the economic potential for the euros coming and firstly the economic potential in terms of the construction of casement park yeah, so, so there's a quirk in our uh, organisation in the department. So TNI is in my brief. I'm not the senior lead on the development of the euros, but that there will be. There's a business case that explains the the, the reason why um, we would invest uh, in bringing the euros to to here. Uh, and so that will be available. I'm afraid I just don't have it, but we can provide that to you absolutely. <coughs> I think that would be useful. And then secondly, just uh, on the subject again of tourism. Uh, I know the minister was asked by other members in the chamber the other day about expanding, you know, the likes of the Wild Atlantic Way, etc., into the north. And in December 22, the Irish government shared island unit announced 7.6 million for projects such as uh, All Ireland Bla All Island brand collaboration. So I'm just kind of asking: Has the department sought to seek any of that money for uh, p potential tourism spend in the north? Yeah, absolutely. So through Tourism Island is is the vehicle through that money spent, and I, I think I believe they've procured people to deliver those particular projects. And likewise, there's also shared island funding on the economic agency cooperation around 30 million. I think that was just announced. So those agencies are working and collaborating um, about how that all island economy that the minister's positioned as a priority could be developed from an organisational perspective. And then specifically for the tourism, he's asked us to look into that branding issue that you've looked at. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thanks, Chair. And just keeping on the issue of tourism, um, obviously the, the consultation in terms of the draft strategy finished not that long ago. Um, <coughs> some initial feedback that I've got is that it's, whilst it's good, it's aspirational. Um, there's very little in it in terms of how <laughs> it's going to be achieved, and that's something that I've heard back. I suppose for yourselves, uh, and we wait, obviously, the response. Do you have a, a rough time scale in terms of when you would expect the consultations have been uh, have um, been assessed, or, or when would you be expect that to be? That's done. So we've done our we've done our bit. Uh, so we've done the homework. There was a, um, a series of engagement that TNI led with industry. That's yes. produced a report. Um, our, our job now is to present that to the minister in terms of feedback. Um, and then obviously when, when the minister's taking a view, we'll be more than happy to come back and explain um, uh, how that fits with the priorities that we've got. But you're right. This is about sort of our, our delivery agencies. So that's TNI and Tourism Ireland um, delivering against those strategies. I think there's. Um, yeah, but we're very happy to come back and brief on that. Yeah, so the assessment of the consultation has been done. It's just waiting for the minister now to get an opportunity. Okay, and see in terms of, obviously there's a change in <coughs> climate, an ongoing change in climate, and we've mentioned in this room before about the, the ETA and the impact that that's potentially going to have. Is that something that's been factored in at this stage in terms of the, the response? Um, Factored in in the sense that it is it, it the is, impact it would have yeah. in terms of delivering some of the aspirations. Yeah, so there's I think there's something around so close to two hundred eighty thousand visitors cross the land border uh, mm. a year. Um, so that that they, in terms of it being factored in, it's um, just how much of an impact it could have um, has has been the focus and. Um, I guess what the response is, there is, you know, over the past couple of years, there is a limited amount that an official can do. You know, having a minister back in place makes that difference. So, that, you know, I know the minister is, uh, is meeting or has met the sector. He wants to understand it from their perspective and then take a view on how he can gauge um, <coughs> the, the decision makers are in the Home Office here, ultimately, uh, <coughs> representation to them so that, that there is an appreciation of, of just how big of a concern this is for the sector.
That's something you obviously you've put to the minister. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's that. So he's so just a, he, he, his intention was to meet the sector first to get their view and, and, and then go and make representations um, on that basis. But it's he is absolutely seized of the, <coughs> the significance and the importance of the. <coughs> Thank you. We haven't adjusted in terms of our, our targets uh, as yet. Though the priority is to try and resolve the issue. Um, Patrick. Yeah. Um, look, my first point had been around ET as well. Um, so. Obviously, we met um, with the Museum of Free Dairy uh, two weeks ago, and, and those concerns were heard loud and clear. Um, so, so definitely, it's just keeping it, I suppose, high up on, on, on the priority agenda. Um, the other thing I was going to raise was around broadband, um, particularly around fibrous, and, and maybe this is something, um, Chair, for, for yourself for consideration as well. Um, but So obviously, that contract with fibrous has gone out um, until 2027. 20, um, for rural broadband connectivity and, and all those things that are essential, um, you know, for households and, and for businesses alike. Um, so that's for Project Stratum. Um, and I think that one of the big things here is that Fibers have now uh, announced redundancies for their construction staff. Um, I'm conscious that that is going to have, you know, a, an impact. And I'm wondering, Chair, could we potentially look at bringing Fibers under the committee um, to discuss that, you know, before. Um, to discuss firstly the outworkings of that for Project Stratum, um, but also before another contract's tendered for. So it's just to get any feedback from, from yourselves on that, and obviously just um, a position from, from Chair, from Committee on that as well. I just think it's good to have the clarity around that and exactly what that means for, for workers and for the delivery of, of these projects going forward. Yeah, do you want it? Uh, I'll let you go first. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so, so we're, we're conscious of that and alive to that. I, I think that's. Um, it's not unexpected, given that that where the contracts are, and as a you know as a commercial organisation, they they have to manage that. We have regular sort of quarterly meetings with them to ensure that project delivery remains on schedule, um, despite them having to adjust to that. Um, uh, and you know we're satisfied as a department that we'll, we'll close the gap. I think we're around one seven one. I think, and we need to get up to around one eighty, uh, close the gap. Um, you will have seen in the briefing pack as well as gigabit uh, and we're moving through the procurement stages in order to announce that and um, uh, to close the, you know because project stratum is you know as many households that we managed to reach um, there are still uh, households and businesses that don't have that level of um, level of connectivity and gigabit will help close that gap as well um, but I know this most of you may will have been involved in the council briefings that fibrous have had so I, I I'd be confident that they'd be more than happy to come along and talk to you about the delivery of stratum and, and from a commercial perspective how they're managing that particular issue okay uh, just a few questions and I have and then Padraig we'll come back to your point at the Absolutely. end of the committee if you're happy uh, just on the Minister's economic vision, what's a good job? Mm. Hangover from the PFG, <laughs> the old one. Um, so he, uh, the Minister gave a sense of the issues that sort of, I guess, that, um, that are undermining the ability of good jobs and, wh and where we want to get to. Uh, can I pick someone? Your point, Sinead, is that we need to develop a metric and provide a metric that provides that type of clarity, not least to our delivery organisations, so they know exactly what they're delivering against, but also for... Uh, the likes of the committee that can um, hold us to account of whether we're delivering that. So that's it's a reasonable question that we need to provide advice to him on and, and, and define it. But I think through his statement, you've got a good sense of where the policies are going to be driving impact. Yeah. So, for example, pay is high up there. For example, you know, like that. Just there will be interpretations of what is a good job. I represent one of the most deprived constituencies in Northern Ireland, and those that I represent may have a different view of what a good job is than someone who lives in a more prosperous part of Northern Ireland. Um, access to those jobs, and yes, pay is important, um, but having that first ability to access those jobs is important. So I'd be very keen just to see how the department define what is a good job um, and how we're actually going to deliver yeah. upon that. Uh, Chair, just, just on that point, I think it's really important to pick up that, so you know, given the, the constituents that you're representing, so it's, if people are outside of the labour market, bring, in, uh, bring them into the labour market. Pay is not the only issue that would define what a good job is. You want to bring people in to have uh, those flexible terms and conditions that it's, you know, it's, it's a satisfying and fulfilling job. There's career progression, for example, as well, that it's not just any job is a good job, that it has to be. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a much wider uh, um, definition uh, of what a good job is. And will the new economic vision be brought to the executive for approval? Um, 
I understand. No, I, I don't think the minister's plans to bring that to executive. The, what, what he set out is very much within the departmental family. You know, this is what we can deliver. Um, if there is, you know, Sinead made reference to a program for government. Is at that point where we sort of represent this is our contribution and it fits into a wider strategic picture that you probably get executive level agreement on what DFE is 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 bringing to the table as a PFG. And then just to touch on project gigabits. So obviously our pack highlights the. Uh, success of Project Stratum in terms of making Northern Ireland the best connected uh, part of these islands, but where are we in terms of the procurement then of the next phase of that? Oh, gigabit, so yeah. uh, just published what's called the, the, the review, so that's identified some 60,000 households that could be in scope. Mm -hmm. um, uh, initial assessment are is that 40,000 40, of that population are probably going to be certainly uh, within scope of a project. There's 20,000 where further work's required to see if it's actually commercial operators um, uh, could meet that demand. Um, so that's the, the target population. That gives you then the basis to go out and procure, uh, and we're working with colleagues in Central Procurement Directive um, to, um, to, to move to the next stage and, uh, and tender for that exercise. And when do you think a tender will go out then? I, I just can't quite remember the date, no, I'm afraid, but um, uh, it's in the near future. But if, if certainly if the clerk writes to us, that's, yeah. that's something that we're able to share, I'm afraid I can't quite. And then just turning to the Belfast City region deal, uh, so two major projects in my constituency, the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Centre and Studio Ulster. Uh, so as you say, uh, Amex full steam ahead and I think shows the benefit of collaboration. I think Queen's University have been a key driver in delivering that project, but also Council stepping up, providing uh, £10 million pounds of funding as well. So I think it just shows that when we work together, that's the way to achieve it. But in relation to Studio Ulster, where are we with that one? Uh, so similar place. So the contract for funding has been signed for Studio Ulster. Um, there is a gateway process occurring this month just to ensure that the project's delivering uh, uh, as expected, uh, uh, you know, all of that is discoverable. So we'll be happy to share the outcomes of that of that um, gateway review. And then the final stage was with all these as a final business case that's due uh, in spring. Problem and air connectivity. I know Paul, you have a massive remit, but does that fall under your remit? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How are we do doing in terms of getting transatlantic flights back from Northern Ireland? Um, so we there was a um, so there's a bit of a history. So if you, if you just bear with me. So um, in the previous minister asked us to uh, assess whether that would be a viable. We progressed a procurement exercise, um, uh, which we were ready to tender to test whether that would be viable. At that point, the um, budget for the department came under extreme pressure. There was a decision taken that that wouldn't be affordable at that stage. Uh, and given that the information that we were basing that decision on dated back to 2019, you know, the world has changed quite considerably since then. So we commissioned another bit of research to say, look, in, you know, in a post-COVID environment, given the, the geopolitical turbulence that's happened, what should be our air connectivity objectives and aims. Uh, so that is near complete, so that's due to be published uh, next month, I think, and that will then set out, look, this, these are the areas where, as a, you know, a small uh, region on an island, separate from uh, mainland Europe, these are, the, these are the destinations that should be a priority for you, given your strengths that exist in your economy. So uh, that's the next step, to try and take stock of where we are, rather than relying, I, I felt we were relying too heavily on uh, evidence that was just clearly out of date. That's an air connectivity review being undertaken by the department? Yeah, so we've, we've worked with experts because obviously this is incredibly technical. Um, yeah, so we, we've commissioned a bit of research to, to provide us with a bit of advice on that. Um, so we publish our research and then we make some policy decisions on the back of that. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen, both for that. Are we happy then, Clark, at this stage, to sum up what we've agreed to? Let the officials go, and I have no idea. Uh, yeah, Paul, stay. You get to stay. stay. You get to stay. You can stay. But, uh, but <laughs> thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, right but um, yeah. anyway, so, Chair, um, uh, in summary, um, I think what the committee is asking for is uh, just further information on the redacted information in respect of RHI from our first day pack. Uh, the point that Mr. Nesbitt made, oh, it's, it's page 380 of your packs. This is about the energy investment, the actual versus the plan, the outputs versus uh, those actions which uh, did not come to pass. Uh, then perhaps also the committee might also write the department seeking their timescale for their energy legislation on the timing and whatever details they can provide in terms of the incentive strategy for uh, heat and indeed uh, renewable electricity generation. 
That's the energy side. On the economy side, it was, uh, I think we're writing to the department seeking their plans for the development of the um, MLK site. Um, we're also asking then about the state of the fibres contact and looking for a timescale on the uh, tender for gigabit and also asking them about the metrics that they intend to develop around good jobs as well as asking for sight of the gateway review of Studio Ulster. Um, additionally, uh, members also asked about the FE model. Uh, so what FE model are they working on and the timing for the introduction of SAME and we're also looking for the business case for uh, Euros and uh, the Caseman Park development so I think that was about all unless I've missed something. Sure. Sure. Okay. Can I just add to the Chair's closing comments about the good jobs indicators? I would be very keen to understand that as well because whenever I was on the other side of this um, in private industry, it was a real bugbear of mine in the old PFJ that we talked about good jobs and I share those frustrations that some people in other areas across Northern Ireland may have a totally different view on what constitutes a good job and that we make sure that there is equity um, in terms of the job market and that everybody is getting the same supports and access to, to work. Yeah, I think Mr. Barrett, yes. Jonathan. Yep. Would it be possible, I think it was unanimous in terms of their viewpoint, that the committee write to the Minister of Infrastructure and the Minister of the Economy expressing the committee's concern regarding planning uh, stalemate in relation to mm -hmm. renewable projects and how that is going to impact upon reaching our target by 2030? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah great. It also ties into your point, Sinead, how can we have regional balance if people can't get to other parts of Northern Ireland? Patrick, just, just, just last point of clarification, yeah. um, just around Fibrous. Yeah. Um, I, th I think while writing to them and, and getting that information would be useful, I do think that it's important that we can extend an invite to committee if that's agreeable with everybody else, because I think to get that real detail um, would be much better if we could do that in person. It's the only concern I would have is just that there's an ongoing, I think there's going to be an ongoing tender for a gigabit. Okay. And so we yeah. might be, I, but I know exactly what the members mean and it would be very oh, interesting course. and it's, a, it's, we need it's an interesting story. Look at that in the hole. Yep. So no, we can no put, problem. put a pin in that and hold that for yep. a little bit. That's Absolutely. Great okay. person. Yeah, no Perfect. Um, wish to um, welcome the uh, individuals from the Maldivian Parliament. Yes, no problem. Well, I'm delighted that we're joined by representatives from the Maldivian Parliament. You're very welcome. I'm delighted that you're joining our proceedings today. Um, hopefully they're exciting, but uh, we are very, very delighted to have you here with us today. We'll now move on to the next item, which is the review of Invest Northern Ireland and Action Plan. Just invite in our other two guests. Okay, members, we have now also been joined by Kieran Donoghue, who is the new Invest Northern Ireland CEO. Congratulations, sir, on your new appointment. We're delighted, we're delighted to have you. And Michelle Scott, uh, Entrepreneurship <coughs> and Provisional De and Partnership Division within the department. Michelle, great to see you. Uh, at this stage, uh, I'm very happy uh, to hand back to you again, Paul. So both Kieran and I would like to make just a very brief opening yeah, remarks, if that's, if that's okay, Chair. Of course. Um, so just to start, you know, you've introduced, but um, so Michelle Scott is the senior partner for Invest and also the director of entrepreneurship and partnership in the, um, in the department. And Kieran obviously introduced as the, as the new uh, CEO. Uh, we're very happy to come and brief on both the, the independent review uh, and also the implementation of the action plan. Uh, we recognise that the review was a watershed moment for Invest and the department and it called for a profound change and we've listened to that um, both within the organisation but also in the relationship between the department and uh, Invest and I. You know, as we, we, we discussed earlier on, the Minister set out a new strategic <coughs> focus. Invest will be integral in delivering against those objectives uh, and the first step for the organisation in delivering um, is the implementation of the action plan uh, and we're collectively <coughs> committed uh, to delivering that. Um, we welcome the committee scrutiny on this and there's um, similar pieces of work that have had quite a large program. Um, we've benefited coming on a, on a regular quarterly basis and preventing something that looks a bit like a dashboard to show progress. We'd be very happy to, to come along if, if the, uh, the clerk is able to engage with the DALO to uh, a, a rhythm that suits you. Uh, we'd really, really welcome that. Um, I was going to give Kevin the opportunity to make a couple of opening remarks as well and then hand back over to you, Chair. Perfect, thank you. Sure, thank you, Paul. Uh, Chair, Mr. Brett, Deputy Chair, Mr. Middleton, uh, committee members, good morning. 
I'm honored to have been appointed Chief Executive Officer of Invest Northern Ireland. And in that capacity, it's a great uh, personal and professional privilege for me to have the opportunity to speak with you today in Parliament buildings. I commenced my new role on January 28, some four weeks ago. As, I, as a result, as you can imagine, I'm still learning about the organisation, its strategy, its structure, processes, procedures, people and personality. I want to thank my new colleagues at Invest and I for the very warm welcome that I have received. In my short time with the organisation, I have observed some very, very impressive capabilities and also, and fundamentally, people's passion and commitment to developing the economy in Northern Ireland. My immediate priorities as the CEO <clears throat> are as follows. Firstly, to incorporate the Minister's economic vision and policy goals into Invest NI's strategy and operating model. As you know, the Minister's policy priorities have been clearly articulated. And as a delivery organisation and as an instrument of government policy, Invest NI will now increase its emphasis on good jobs, productivity, decarbonisation and regional balance. The Minister has also emphasised his wish that um, co-design and a genuine partnership approach to addressing economic challenges and opportunities, and we'll also reflect that strongly in our future operating model. As you know, the organisation will meet its commitments under the action plan prepared in response to the independent review. There are 35 actions uh, in the plan, uh, which Invest in I is implementation lead on approximately uh, 26. The target finish dates for the action run from December last year, 2023, to December 2026, but the majority of the actions are scheduled for implementation in the current calendar year, 2024. I'm pleased to report that progress is already being made on a number of actions, which include my appointment, the appointment of a new chair, Mr John Healy, the completion of a board effectiveness review, and the development of a new communications and engagement strategy. Collectively, I think it's fair to say that the actions represent a fundamental organisational transformation of Invest NI, but I do believe that their implementation will strengthen the organisation and position it to play a leading role in building a strong, self-sustaining economy in Northern Ireland based on high levels of entrepreneurship, new firm formation, inward investment, innovation, sustainability and much improved regional balance. Thank you for listening to my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, can I firstly congratulate the department on the appointment of the chief executive and the new chair? I think this is a very, very exciting time and very, very meritorious appointment. So congratulations. Uh, Kieran, we both started this new job in January, so we're all new to this. Uh, so you're very welcome. Uh, I want to focus on some of the future, if possible. If that's okay with you, Kieran. Firstly, good jobs. You're going to take forward the Minister's vision for a good job. I asked his officials earlier what was a good job. Uh, what's your view on what a good job is? So for me, a good job clearly is partly derived from the average salary that that job pays. And we know what the median salary in Northern Ireland is. Uh, my understanding it's circa £29,000. Anything at or above that median would strike me as a good job just in terms of income but we also need to pay attention to the quality of the jobs and the roles and that people will be playing in various business enterprises, that they're rewarding, intellectually stimulating, that they're associated with product and process uh, um, innovation, <clears throat> that the people that are working in the jobs feel that they are in gainful employment and rewarding employment both for them personally, for the firms that they work in and, and for the wider community. We haven't got to a stage yet, Chair, where we have a clear <coughs> definition of what good jobs mean for the purposes of strategy, but these will be some of the building blocks that uh, I and colleagues in the department will be considering over the next number of weeks. Perfect. And I just made the point to officials that I represent North Belfast and that inner part of the city. Some people will, will never obtain a job at £29,000, and it's to put into perspective that moving them into the labour market for them will be a good job and it will be good for the community and good for our constituency that we move people from economic inactivity back into to the labour market. In your first few weeks, I just wanted to check what are we good at at Invest NI and what are we bad at and what lessons can we learn from uh, your tenure uh, in the Republic of Ireland and the success uh, that you were able to oversee in their investment strategy? So in my first four weeks, Chair, Invest Northern Ireland is very good at lots of things. 
Um, I've been very, very impressed um, with the data and analytical capabilities of the organisation. We will never fail to take a, a proper decision for the want of data and proper analysis, and I find that um, very, very encouraging. Um, the relationships that we have with existing clients, both in Northern Ireland and overseas, is very impressive. And many clients have commented very positively to me on the strength of that relationship and of the quality service that they're receiving from Invest Northern Ireland. I think we have a very good handle on where there are new investment opportunities um, for Northern Ireland. Um, <coughs> we have an excellent approach to risk management and assurance. The risk dashboards and the approach, the system, systematic approach to identifying and managing risk is among the most impressive that I've seen in any public body uh, that I've worked in. And again, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the passion and the commitment that people have in the organisation and doing their very best for the people of Northern Ireland. It's that part of the DNA and of the culture of the organisation is something that I propose to build on over the next number uh, of months. In relation to maybe some of the things that we could do better, um, I think at times maybe we have an over-engineered, maybe overly bureaucratic approach to some of our processes, um, and that some small and medium-sized enterprises find that challenging in terms of engaging with us on the process, and notwithstanding the fact that we are custodians of public funds and we need to manage those funds appropriately and do appropriate due diligence before we deploy them in pursuit of our mission. There's probably ways in which we can optimise that process to make it more user and business friendly, and a number of firms have commented um, on that challenge <coughs> to me personally, and the offer that I've made to them is let's sit down and co-design, in the spirit of the observation made by, by Minister Murphy, let's co-design a response to those challenges so that we can optimise our processes and make it easier for you to start a business or to do R&D or, or innovation. So they are some of the things that we're already looking at internally. And in the Republic, you were very good at serving the entirety of the Cabinet, um, particularly around St Patrick's Day, you know, missions out right across the world. Uh, Invest NI has sometimes been seen solely as a tool to be used by the Department for the Economy. Do you think there's a role for Invest NI to, to work with and serve the whole executive and executive ministers all plugging into that work? My view right now, and as I say, I'm four weeks in the job, so I'm still trying to educate myself about Northern Ireland's institutional arrangements and institutional processes. But as a public body, we are a servant uh, of the executive. So I would see us facilitating the executive to promote and market Northern Ireland overseas, particularly at that um, time of the year around March. <coughs> and I understand that representatives of the executive, the First and Deputy First Minister and Minister Murphy will be actively participating in programmes co-designed by Invest Northern Ireland next month. Perfect. And just one question for officials. So. A lot of the focus <coughs> of the report and the media commentary around that was changes within Invest NI, but the Lions report also highlights the department's need to better communicate with Invest NI, better communicate ministerial priorities and, and work together. So from a departmental perspective, uh, we've heard from some of the changes that uh, Invest have done in terms of change of leadership but all in change of culture. In terms of the departmental's role in that, um, what's the take on the action plan so far? Yeah, so there's a, <coughs> there's a specific action, and uh, Michelle can uh, add a little bit more detail on that, but in, in real terms, you've seen that this week in that the Minister provided uh, an outline of his strategic focus. It's us working, you know, as, as, as Ken suggested, in collaboration then with Invest to bring in operational leads that understand what's happening on the ground with policy people together to understand what that means and translating that into, into practice. And Michelle, do you want to, anything else about the, the uh, specific action that we've got about how we communicate um, policy? Well, I think so. Michael gave us the challenge that both Invest and I and the department need to be better partners um, and need to have clear lines of communication between the two organisations. We've put a lot of work into that. Um, over the last year since Sir Michael published his report, um, we're about to publish a new partnership agreement between the Department and Invest and I, and there's been a lot of collaboration between the two partners um, to ensure that that reflects um, how those lines of communication, a, a particular strength of the new partnership agreement, is um, an engagement plan um, that says exactly who needs to speak to who 
and when to resolve issues, for example, around new policy as it emerges. Um, it, is, it is an ongoing um, exercise um, and there, there are challenges for both Invest and I and the department within the Lions report and, and we are answering those on a live basis. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Mike. Yeah, thank you. You're all very welcome. And Karen, I, I wish you well in the new role. Thanks, sir. A couple of comments, if I may, Michelle. Just on that last point, are you saying that the management statement financial memorandum is being uh, migrated over to partnership agreement? Yes. Okay. Um, a, a comment, if I may, Karen, before we get to the question about uh, and the comments about good jobs. And I get what you're saying, but I would argue that that a good job may not be a very well-paid job. So. We tend to have an educational system, I think, where if a new supermarket is opening, we think there's only three good jobs, being the managing director, the financial director, or the head of human resources. But if nobody's stacking shelves, nobody's driving the forklifts, we may starve. So that, those jobs may be good jobs if they're jobs that people choose to take a pride in. They're not a good job if that's all they can get. But they could be potentially good jobs, and I hope, I hope you would accept that that point. My my question is about how you read yourself in, and I would take it that the Lions report is is a key document for you. What surprised you, in a bad way? What surprised me um, in a bad way? I I don't think anything surprised me in a bad way. I would say that. So ba bad, you know, isn't isn't the way that I viewed the, the report. I viewed it as, a, as holding a mirror up to the organization and a factual articulation of some of the, the strengths of the organization, because strengths were identified, but also some, some of the challenges. I would say one of the things that did uh, jump, out, jump out at me was the, uh, the statement around the fact that, you know, the relationships with a small group of firms and the challenges um, with that, and some of the, the um, I would say, some of the statements around the client company model. Because given my background, uh, I come from an agency which places a lot of emphasis on the strength of the relationship with individual companies. And it took me a while to understand what Lyons was trying to say, and I eventually twigged it. It was about ensuring that the firm, that you work with a broad base of firms and that your approach to economic development is as inclusive as possible, and that you don't always emphasize the strong and the large firms at the expense of the weak and the vulnerable or those that are trying to establish businesses for the first time. Uh, so my initial reading of that kind of jarred with me, but only given my previous experience, which was working with very large multinational companies. And I think that observation now has significant merit. But nothing, no, I, I didn't see anything bad um, in the report. I noted all of the comments about leadership um, and the structure of the organization and some concerns about its strategy and its approach to business development, but I wasn't surprised by them. Okay, maybe to put it another way, there were things you read and you thought, oh, I wouldn't have done it like that. There was things that I read that said to me, that, that's a strange thing to say when you're reading about an economic development um, agency. But, you know, Lines is a very large report, as you know, it's more than 300 pages. So on a second reading, I understood what, what they were driving at. I didn't have the benefit of talking either to Lines um, or to the people in Invest Northern Ireland at that point in time. So Michael also had some things to say about funding sources. Yes. Would you concur that you need to broaden out? Yes, I do. Given the fiscal constraints in Northern Ireland, if um, Invest Northern Ireland wants to achieve all that it does want to achieve for the economy, it needs to identify as many sources of funding as it possibly can and leverage those to good effect. Thank you, Thanks. David. Thank you, uh, Kieran. <coughs> lovely to meet you and wish you all the best uh, you, as well. And, and Michelle, lovely to meet yourself. I'm uh, like <coughs> about three weeks into this as well, so we're, uh, we're, we're getting the grips. But I, I asked the Minister last week, and I just want to start with it. The, the report said profound change and reform and repurposing was required of Invest and I, and is Invest and I capable of doing that work and also selling Northern Ireland supporting local businesses at the same time? Short answer is yes. Um, we have 650 staff, so we have considerable headcount. Um, we're continuing to do the day job while at the same time 
working to implement all of the actions. We have out to December 2026. So I think the program of work is very structured, very systematic. And um, I see good evidence of progress against all of the actions. And none of my colleagues are saying that what we've been asked to do is, is in any way impossible. Okay. Now, the, the second part of that says the agency needs to be a better partner, particularly in a sub-region <coughs> uh, context. The, the context of, if you, look at, if you look at the economy in Northern Ireland, basically hasn't worked to this point, if, we, if we're brutally honest with this, that we, we are in deficit and we need, we need to grow that economy. Does that sub-regional context, in your view, then mean within, with, um, solely within the UK or within, uh, invest within the sub-region of Northern Ireland, or is that on an all-island or across both of these, or both of islands? Well, when, when, I, when I hear a reference to sub-regional, my interpretation right now, and again, um, I stand to be corrected, it's about driving further investment and originating more, more firms uh, within the um, at, at council area or at sub Northern Ireland level within Northern Ireland. So in the Northwest, in Fermanagh, in, in Tyrone, and ensuring that there's a better balance between what we're achieving um, in the Belfast area and elsewhere around Northern Ireland. So that's my current conception of what we mean by improved regional balance. Clearly to do that, we're going to have to build trade relationships across Great Britain, across Europe, with the Republic of Ireland and other over overseas markets <coughs> and cooperate <coughs> with the authorities in other jurisdictions to help us to realise our economic ambition here. Okay, so where's the partnership there? Is that with, then you send that with the councils here or is that with the IDA or is it with, you know, with it within GB? I think the partnerships exist everywhere where it makes sense for us as an organisation and for our clients and for new businesses. So my understanding is we already have a very strong relationship um, with the local councils and local stakeholders. I met with representatives from Fermanagh uh, only last week. I sense tremendous goodwill towards Invest Northern Ireland and a desire to build upon the existing relationships but in a more structured fashion. So that's something that we're going to do. We already have very strong relationships on an all-island basis with Enterprise Ireland, which we will build upon. I think the recent announcement of the shared island funding for Enterprise represents an opportunity, a pot of money that we can leverage in partnership with Enterprise Ireland and Intertrade Ireland for the benefit of businesses in Northern Ireland. And I would like to think that I can leverage my relationships with IDEA Ireland for the benefit of Northern Ireland um, as well. Absolutely, yeah. welcome that. Really welcome that. Uh, just on the last thing, then, just on that leverage point, uh, on the action points of three point one, it says about there's um, bespoke access to finance of uh, invested forty to my eyesight's down sixty million uh, on uh, on future growth Dur during COVID. So forty million, sixty million going out to, to finance. Ha have invest, and I know you're only in the job, so this is. But have they looked at leveraging bank? And, and debt finance with that. And we, we looked at the bounce back loans that happened during COVID and it was guaranteed, but it was the banks delivering. A lot of small businesses can't access bank um, investment or bank loans or, or that debt market um, because of risk and banks aren't simply lending at, at the minute to them. And we, we hear constantly, have Invest looked at, in, instead of just giving out grants, uh, as I said, just guaranteeing um, to, to banks that, that would allow that, that amount of money to be leveraged substantially more than that. And, and given that bounce back loan, there was only, a, I think it was 25, 30% okay, loss within that, but the, the, there's a massive gain to be had if that could be realized. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, I'm aware that we have equity in grant instruments. So <coughs> we have a variety of funding instruments that we use to, to implement uh, our mission. What you're suggesting is something that we c could consider. I'm not aware if we do it right now. So there's a um, so I guess it's complicated, isn't it? The landscape. So yeah, so Intertrade Island is active. So colleagues in the south, there's, there's quite a, um, 
<coughs> uh, and, and debt and equity market, and also British Business Bank recently, fairly recently launched the 70 million fund split between debt and equity. I think the challenge from us as policymakers and as, as investors organisation is how do you make that cohesive? So if, if BBB show up with 70 million, invest have the instruments, providing that there's budget, I do make sure that's complementary and adds adds value to um, the, the total pot of money that's available. Uh, and then the exercise in how to get access to the businesses that need it, as you say, the ones that come, can't access on a market-based um, solution. You know, that's the role of government as a market failure there. That's exactly what we ought to be doing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, how are you? Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Um, and good luck in the new role. Um, how will Invest and I work alongside further education colleges? How, how do we propose to? Yeah. Um, quite honestly, that's not something that I, I have yet considered in de detail. I will have to sit down and talk to, to my colleagues to understand the current suite of arrangements in relation to partnering with further education colleges. But what I can say is given the importance that all of our existing clients and would-be investors attach to skills, uh, to employees and to graduate output, having a functioning uh, and collaborative partnership with further education colleges will, will be fundamental to our future strategy. I can't speak right now to the mechanics of that until I understand currently how it's working and how it might be improved and built upon. But I'm committed to developing that relationship for the reasons I've outlined. Yeah, I think that's going to be really key going forward, um, particularly in terms of the type of economy that we have. Yes. And obviously, my colleagues previously spoke about the good jobs measure. And I think that's really critical because we want growth, but we want inclusive growth. And we know that if we don't have a vibrant and thriving further education sector, we're not going to be able to meet our economic targets. So I would be keen to hear in the future how that relationship has been defined and, and, and progresses. Just in terms of risk, you had mentioned, um, not to mischaracterise, but you had mentioned about you know governance and risk and all those things in your opening remarks. So in terms of the actual um, report about Invest, um, it says that there was the Governance and Compliance Council was created in response to investment <laughs> in the field project, um, but as such, the report and lines and responsibilities between the Audit and Risk Committee and the Internal Audit Committee are unclear. Um, and obviously that is key um, in terms of just how we actually do things going forward. So I was just wondering if there was any particular um, ideas you might have around that or if you wanted to speak to that at all. I'm looking forward to, to add, to, to be honest, when I spoke about me, um, the fact that I was impressed with the approach to risk, it was in relation to the <coughs> systematic approach to the visualisation dashboard so senior decision makers can see the risks that we're exposed to at any particular point in time. When you have a review as comprehensive as, as lines, it's inevitable that they will point out areas that can be built upon uh, and improved. I don't think that's inconsistent with, with my high level observation when I compare what I've seen in the first four weeks to what I observe in, in, other, in other public bodies. Um, the point that you raise is subject to ongoing work by one of the task and finish groups and will be addressed as part of our implementation of the action plan. Okay, and just lastly, in terms of my colleague <coughs> there had, had raised the opportunities that present themselves, obviously we do now have dual market access and it's my understanding that a recent tender had closed in terms of understanding the role of DFE and Invest in I and how we actually leverage the opportunities presented by the dual market access. Has that tender exercise actually completed? Um, and is that now moving on and in progress? I'm not familiar with the status of the tender exercise, but I can uh, inquire and follow up and provide that information um, to your office on the essential point about dual market access. We are now committed to exploiting that because it's in the commercial interests of all of the business um, in Northern Ireland. Okay. As, a, just, sorry, sorry, as a department level, we commit. Uh, so there's research that we've done at a, uh, at a high level that identifies where non-tariff barriers uh, indicate that there might be a competitive advantage for being located here. That the next stage of that, as I understand it, is then get down to product level. So it it, may, it makes sense to individual businesses, uh, and that works ongoing. But we can, as, as when the clerk writes to us and Kieran provides an update on the tender, we can include the current up, current position of that research uh, and yeah. share that with you as well. Thank you.
Gary. Thanks, Chair, and Echo, obviously, our best wishes to you, Kieran, and the incoming uh, Chair. Uh, obviously, you're in a matter of weeks, so <laughs> we don't expect you to have solved all of the problems as of yet. Um, the Lions review, obviously, and, and I take your point, I think that you know it was a timely review, and you take it as it is uh, and address the issues in it. Uh, it was already touched on in terms of the agency needs to be a better partner, particularly in the sub-regional context. Kieran, you're obviously coming with huge experience in your, your previous role, and I think it's a fantastic catch for Invest NA to get you. Um, have you any thoughts in terms of the, the sub-regional piece? Uh, we hear a lot about targets, uh, potential legislation, um, in, in terms of you know obviously bringing jobs. Ultimately, it's for the, the businesses. But are there any initial thoughts in terms of your previous experience about how to focus investors in particular areas? Firstly, you need to focus the Economic Development Agency. So I think targets are a good idea because in my experience, targets drive, firstly, prioritization, secondly, behavior, and third, resource allocation. So I can remember a time in, in my previous role where the bulk of investment was attaching to the Eastern Seaboard of the Republic of Ireland, to Dublin, and that the organization IDA Ireland took an explicit decision for equity and efficiency reasons and in response to policy direction coming from government that we needed to deliver more investment outside the Dublin area. I see what's happening in Northern Ireland as, as broadly similar to that. We need to drive and deliver more business uh, into the regions. And so defining what the optimal, what the region is for the purposes of setting realistic targets is something that I believe that we actually should do. Um, and that then will drive behaviour because the people that work in economic development agencies, particularly those at the front end in terms of business development, they're very target driven. And they respond to the signals sent to them by giving them those types of targets. Then with respect to ensuring that we do win more investment for the regions. Uh, I think sitting down in a spirit of partnership with the councils and other local stakeholders and developing what I would call a regional strategic agenda for that region saying, these are the strengths of the region. These are its current assets. These are its deficits. These are the areas that we need to invest in or areas of weakness that we <coughs> need to address. And then working on those collectively while leveraging the existing strengths and then putting a proposition together that makes the region as attractive as possible for the investor is the systematic approach that I would propose that we uh, adopt in, rela in relation to that priority of improved regional balance. Oh, and and I, I welcome uh, those comments. Obviously, there was a recognition that the agency needs to be a better partner. Uh, my experience of people who've actually done business with Invest and I actually was a positive one. Yes. Um, but what I would say is, with respect in terms of the, the, the sub-regional context, there does need to be a marked improvement in terms of that partnership working together with the councils uh, and with existing businesses who exist as well. Just about better understanding what you do but given you're in a few weeks, I don't expect that to happen. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident But what you're saying, if that comes to materialise, I think it'll be a, a marked change in that respect. So if I can just add, <coughs> you know, as a measure of my commitment to the regional balance um, priority, I'm going next week to see all of our, our regional offices because I want to sit down with the teams in our offices and learn about their experience and understanding of the communities that they live in and serve get a feeling for the geography and of the landscape and of the local businesses and then sit down with the stakeholders, the councils and all of the local businesses and then I, I will have a better understanding of how best to approach that task in partnership with them. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Okay. Um, you're not surprised I'm keeping with the same thing. Um, and, and it's good to see you again. Uh, and uh, I formally welcome you to the role uh, and wish you all the best in it. Um, Kieran, you obviously come from uh, experience uh, in IDA, um, but you work within uh, structures in the national spatial uh, and the national framework or planning frameworks. How did IDA work with with, with uh, those frameworks in order to deliver for the sub-regions and, and I note in, in the spatial uh, framework in the Republic of Ireland they talk about the hub of Letterkenny and Derry and how in, in that organisation in IDA did they work um, in, 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 towards supporting the gateways and the hubs? 
So the way Idea Ireland approached it was that we would have been invited um, by government and by officials to actively <coughs> participate in the design of the National Spatial Strategy and the National Development Plan in my capacity uh, at that time. And I should say for the avoidance of doubt, Idea Ireland is my past now. Invest Northern Ireland uh, is my presence. presence so I don't and our questions will be focused on the review of Invest NI and how it works moving forward, but I get the context you're saying. So yeah, no yeah problem but, but for context, yeah. so we would have, I, in my capacity as head of strategy and planning and public policy, I would have sat down with officials and said, here's Idea Ireland's thoughts on what the national spatial strategy should look like from an inward investment perspective and then the strategy would have been designed taking account of our inputs, contributions, views and perspectives and then equally in relation to the National Development Plan because that was fundamentally about deciding what infrastructure does the Government of the Republic of Ireland need to invest in to drive economic development. We again would have said these are the assets and the infrastructures that you need to invest in and these are the locations that you need to invest in them. So right from the get-go our views would have been reflected in policy. <coughs> then once the policy had been approved by government, we would have shifted our focus to operationalizing those policies. And that was done and driven through our regional office network. Similar to Invest Northern Ireland, our people on the ground, working and living in those communities, um, managing relationships with, with local businesses and stakeholders, and driving the implementation of the National Spatial Strategy and NDP in that, in that manner. And it would have also been reflected in, in, our, tar in our targets. Yeah, and that's what I was getting to, Chair. Um, um, and it, it's driven through legislation and your work, and, 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 and there's an element of co-design in and around that, and that's really important. But just back to your very first statement about good jobs and about the 20, uh, 29 um, average. I mean, in, in the northwest, for example, it's 10,000 less than that at the median average. So that gives you the idea of the differentiation in such a small place uh, that is Northern Ireland. And productivity is actually 10% less as well. And economic inactivity, we're sitting way above 35% uh, of economic inactivity in, in, um, in, in the northwest. And I think the average in the UK is sitting at 20.8%. So there is a real, you know, real disparities within a very, very small small uh, region as Northern Ireland. So the, the regional equity is a really big focus um, for, for us that have I've been working in economic development for, for many, many years. And we're not closing the gaps. The gaps are getting bigger. And it's fundamental. You can't do it all. Um, with the greatest expect, Invest in I can't actually do it all. And in fact, the Department for Economy can't do it all. It has to be a wider focus. Regional balance is a long-term plan, and it has to be a wider focus um, for all of us. So it, it's, it's what levers, the economic levers, do you need in order to sell a region like the Northwest? You know, productivity is around skills. It's around skills and are further in higher education institutions. It's around, uh, you know, it's, it's around even school levers mm -hmm. coming out. Where, where is the support mechanism for you in order to get to what you have to deliver. So, for example, between the uh, London Dairy Chamber of Commerce said between 2020 and 2023, 4,585 jobs um, were announced for Belfast and 641 jobs were announced for Dairy. The Dairy Chamber of Commerce are, are saying 50% of all FDI should go in to the Northwest in order to have a positive discrimination, uh, a regional equity. How, how, how can we do that if you don't have the other levers at your disposal and how can you influence um, other departments to make sure that you get um, the support that you need in order to deliver on the vision of the Minister? So there's a lot in that. Um, so in short, I believe that the, the Government of Northern Ireland has given me levers that I can use to you know, achieve the agenda that you've set out there. So I have over 600 staff, very capable staff, based in Northern Ireland and around the world in overseas markets. I have an annual budget in excess of uh, 100 million, million pounds. I have a network of regional offices. I have a client base of north of 5,000 client companies, which includes more than 400 global firms. They are the levers that I need to manage um, 
to pursue that agenda that you, you've set out. And they're, they're very impactful levers if used correctly on the, the broader issue of the public policy framework within which we operate. Um, I believe I'm constructing a very good relationship with both Paul and Michelle and colleagues in the Department of the Economy, and we will sit down collectively, and I will be honest with them and tell them what I think and say, these are the other interventions that we need to be making or may be making representations to colleagues in other departments, that if those interventions are made, for example, in the infrastructure area, it will help us collectively to achieve our mission. Mm -hmm. So that will begin with a, a conversation clarity around what those interventions should be in the infrastructure side as we develop our regional strategic agendas and we will communicate to, to that to relevant colleagues across the Northern Ireland Civil Service. That then begun, becomes the basis for progress in relation to the agenda and the concerns you've set out. Okay, and another, you, you've mentioned the, the sub-regional strategies coming forward and that, a, a part of that was a, a bit about decentralisation as well in relation to um, the number of people you have working. There's about 540 plus working in, in Bedford Street uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like you do have a Belfast-centric um, mindset if, if everybody is, is working in the same space. So is there any, you know, uh, vision of, of um, building up the sub-regional offices to provide that high level of support to the small uh, businesses uh, and the small entrepreneurs and building up an entrepreneurship uh, kind of um, uh, DNA with it within the sub-regions because you you said to me there the other day there was two areas and and, and that is the incentives for for local businesses um, and also FDA but you, you you need your people on the ground help and support those small businesses in a very practical and real way yeah so while a majority of our staff might be nominally attached to our headquarters in Belfast because 70 percent of our staff are client facing most of those people spend their time on the road talking to clients right across Northern Ireland. And now in a post-COVID world, a lot of those people are working from home as well, but they're effectively in their cars every day, sitting down talking to existing um, or potential, potential new businesses. Uh, in relation to any potential you know, redistribution <coughs> or reallocation of headcount between our offices, for me, everything begins with strategy. We need clarity about what the new strategy of the organization is going to be, ensure its alignment with public policy and the priorities as set out by the minister. And then we will decide on the optimal balance of where those resources are based, whether it's in Bedford Street yeah. or in our regional offices. Right now, without preempting any decisions I and our board might take over the short to medium term, I would expect that our presence in the regions, in, in the regional offices, will be dialed up over time. But the specifics of that, I can't comment on right now. It's early days. Okay. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And firstly, welcome, Kieran and Michelle, to, to committee. And Kieran, I want to congratulate you on your new role. Uh, the role of Invest NI is something that is very important to me. It's certainly something that I want to focus on during my time at committee. Um, and whilst it's been a couple of very difficult years for the organization, I just want to put on record my huge thanks to the professionalism of many of Invest NI's employees over the years who have done a fantastic job in bringing inward investment into Northern Ireland and projecting it in a very positive light, albeit through sometimes very different, difficult political circumstances. So I just want to put that out there. Um, one point of criticism, and I know we tend to dwell on criticisms, and obviously, as I think Gary had said, you know, we take the lands review as it is. It's a, it was a timely uh, review of the organisation to recalibrate, to look forward. When we look at the Minister's vision, and one part in which, which I certainly did agree with was quite often Invest NI, its reputation for local Indigenous business was quite negative when you compare it to some of the international successes that it had. What support will there be going forward for Indigenous businesses? Because one of the key blockades to that often was that need to be already exporting before you would be able to uh, engage Invest NI for support. And I always thought that the huge gap within that was well, to enable them to export quite often, they need the support at that early stage, but it was never forthcoming. So firstly, um, thank you for your very kind remarks in relation to, to colleagues in, in Invest Northern Ireland. Uh, that, that is much, much appreciated. I, I know there's a public perception that Invest Northern Ireland's priority or emphasis is on inward investment 
at the expense of local businesses and small and medium-sized enterprises. But in my short time in the organization, all of the data and statistics that I have seen and been briefed on shows that the bulk of our activity, <coughs> our financial offers, our funding and resources goes actually towards local business rather than the, the multinational side of the house. But to answer your core question about what we plan to do to dial up and to double down on our support for local business, I think part of that is a, a strategic issue. So it's making a commitment to do that in our strategy, then reflecting that in our structure, because we have two client groups, um, startups, small and medium sized enterprises trying to establish a toehold in their, their home market before exporting and then the multinationals. And we need to configure and select people that are good at working with those different client groups. And that's something that we're actively planning to do. And then once we have done that, we will do, uh, devise a range of new or modified programs and interventions that are customized to <coughs> reflect the often unique and specific needs of small local businesses uh, rather than multinationals. So that's systematically, that's how we're thinking about approaching that issue that you raised. Okay. Um, another key concern for industry at the moment is obviously the declining birth rates right across the Western world, but particularly if we look at in the, the British Isles in general, which could mm. evidently have a, an impact upon labour force in the future. Is there a, a forward-looking vision towards support in relation to automisation uh, of certain industries support packages and I even think of developments with AI for example uh, has there been any interest in that regard are we seeing an uptick in terms of uh, that space in re relation to how Northern Ireland can play its part yes that's a great question I met with a group of manufacturers only uh, yesterday evening and they observed to me that they are now devising <laughs> plans on the basis that it will become much more challenging for them yeah to find and hire suitably skilled people. And therefore, they are actively looking at how they can deploy robotic process uh, automation and capital equipment to increase the capital <laughs> intensity of what they do, which will potentially help deliver productivity gains consistent with the, uh, the minister's policy goals, but prepare them for a future where the labor intensity of production will decline and the capital intensity increase. So that is something that um, businesses in Northern Ireland are already alert to, and I think we can play our role in supporting them um, with that transition because it'll make them fit for purpose in the marketplace and their competitors are, are already doing this. In relation to artificial intelligence, that's something that many of our existing clients are already uh, using and propose to uh, adopt even more. And I was heartened last week when I re met a very young entrepreneur who has established a very well-known artificial intelligence company <coughs> in Belfast, which is now uh, making very positive noise in the global marketplace based on the quality of its technology. And so we're partnering with that firm. We're already an investor in that firm and through our relationship with that company. We're learning about how more artificial intelligence technologies can be developed here in Northern Ireland, but also deployed and used by industry in Northern Ireland to make them more competitive. It's, it's interesting to hear, and it's, it's certainly warming to hear that Invest and I have that forward vision in relation to these different aspects. The last question is very much on an international focus, and given more from your experience, perhaps you could, could bear comment. Um, just last week, the minister said that quite often when international investors look uh, towards Northern Ireland, they don't look at geographical differentials whenever they think of the island of Ireland and the two jurisdictions. Do they look at tax differentials? They do uh, look at tax differentials, but <coughs> tax is, is a less a driver of investment decision making than it would have been 20 years ago. That's partly to do with greater harmonization in relation to global tax rates as a consequence of the OECD BEPS process, where now many, many jurisdictions are gravitating towards that effective 15% rate. So that traditional cost um, tax arbitrage opportunity that investors would have exploited, that's not there for them anymore. And when I talk to investors in my previous role, the key driver for them, in addition to market access, was skills. It was people. 
And the point they made to me is, if we don't find good people and hire them, and those people don't develop novel product and process technologies, and we don't successfully sell that in the marketplace, we won't have to worry about tax because we won't be generating any profits <coughs> to pay tax on. So mm -hmm. it's skills and people that has now become the principal driver. And I would expect that when international investors look in at Northern Ireland and the Republic, they're not really doing a compare <coughs> and contrast in relation to the tax rates. They're saying, here are the, the advantages of locating in Northern Ireland from a market access perspective, and here's the quality of the people coming out of Ulster and Queens and the further education colleges. Here's how they work. Uh, here's the contribution that they're making to product and process innovation by the existing investors that are already in Northern Ireland. That's increasingly the basis for their decision making, in addition to costs, because businesses will always be cost sensitive. And Northern Ireland at the moment <coughs> is a very attractive cost arbitrage, um, which investors are utilising. Because obviously it's a, it's a unique conversation, in particular I think we need an honest conversation about it here in Northern Ireland. If we're going to provide InvestNI with the appropriate toolkit to attract uh, international clientele, I, I find it hard to believe that corporation tax, for example, is not a key consideration. Uh, when you think about harmonization, and I know that pushed towards 15%, well, ultimately now we see a greater differential whenever we look at 25% at present in Northern Ireland compared to 125 albeit that may change and will change will in change. the Republic of Ireland, how that is not an impacting upon inward investment when I think of its ability to attract more foreign investment, encourage local businesses to invest further, drive competitiveness, stimulate economic growth. Uh, it Was it not a unique selling point for the Republic of Ireland? Uh, was that not put up in lights for international investors to come and invest successfully in the Republic of Ireland during your time there? It, it was one strong aspect of our value proposition for many, many years. But as I said, in, in recent years, um, tax is not top of the agenda when we sit down, when IDA sat down to speak uh, with investors. And tax will always be one of a number of factors that they will take account of. My point is, it wasn't as much a driver in recent years as it had been historically. Um, and even less so now because of the move to the effective 15% rate. It also depends on the way companies structure themselves. If they structure themselves with balance sheet and P&L and as profit and revenue generating um, centers, then tax will be more of a consideration. But if they structure themselves as cost centers or service centers to the wider group, tax is less of a driver of the investment decision. Okay, I'll finish with this question, Sharon. Thanks for your indulgence. In relation to corporation tax, in, in your view, uh, to provide InvestNI with the appropriate toolkit to attract uh, international investment, if we had the same corporation rate as that of the Republic, regardless of what that rate would be, would it make InvestNI's job easier in attracting uh, inward investment rather than at a differential rate higher and making it harder? It would make it easier and it would increase the attractiveness of Northern Ireland where the businesses that you're targeting involve profit generating activities, certainly. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Thank you sir. Just to, just if I could, just to add, I think there's <clears throat> Kim has provided a, 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 a direct answer. There are there are wider effects of that as well. That you know, this is not a a, a single decision. But there, there is a cost attached to the uh, policy decision. Aware, that but but and there will be equal and opposite effects in what invest and I yep. can do Philip. across the piece. Yep. Yep. Thank you. And obviously, that point uh, is very important. But I mean, I think if. Jonathan's arguing for integration of policies across the island, then I think we should be all getting <laughs> on, <laughs> totally get on board, <laughs> board, 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 tax on board with that. I was with you. Uh, you want to sign up to it now? <laughs> 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 no, I, I, it's not even so well. <laughs> I, I think it's a, a coming together of common sense rather than, than anything more than that. Uh, Kieran, good luck uh, in your new role. Congratulations and welcome, uh, Michelle, Thank to. You. All the questions, most of them, sorry, that I intended to ask, uh, ha have been asked. Uh, funny enough, <laughs> by Jonathan. <laughs> but uh, m moving on to one that haven't, uh, you, you talked about 650 staff, and I, and I noticed from y your report the kind of various locations and the numbers. Uh, I mean, 
key to the success, or sorry, I mean, we're, we're all recognising the growth in the all-island economy, all joking aside, very important, uh, and it's going to continually be very important, and I'm sure it's going to be very important to the work that, that you and your team do. Th- there's eight, currently eight staff in Dublin. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think, is it, is it something that you would review in terms of the growth of the all-island economy, looking at the staff and in terms of numbers, but also maybe uh, offices on uh, border regions just to promote and increase and expand the kind of all Ireland economy? Um, I actually thought the number of people we had in Dublin was less than eight. If it was eight, I'd be very pleased. Um, Maybe I got it wrong. So I, I thought it was three or four. But to, to your central point, firstly, I should say we are have moved, in the process of moving to a new office in Dublin, and it'll be an expanded office. And I do believe that will play a key role in our future strategy because I see a lot of commercial opportunities both on the trade side for Northern Ireland, small and medium-sized enterprises, but also on the inward investment side uh, from the Republic. So it's a market um, in our near neighbour that we need to pay uh, closer attention to, and we w- will be doing that. I think, again, to go back to my essential observation, but once there's clarity about the strategy, we will have to review our office network, um, both within Northern Ireland and the Republic and, and further afield to make sure that they are appropriately staffed, not only with the right number of people, but people with the right skills uh, aligned with the market opportunities in the markets which those offices uh, are serving. Uh, so that's something that we will certainly consider. Thank you. And um, Patrick. Yeah, um, look, just to welcome you both to the committee and, and Kieran in your new role as well. Um, I'm looking forward to, to working with you. Um, so Sinead and, and Gary both touched on uh, a piece which I was going to uh, touch on, which is on regional balance. Um, I think one of the big indicators there is obviously around the resource um, that's committed, and, and we, we have explored that in, in detail um, in Belfast versus other areas, particularly in Derry. I, I do see that as one indicator. Um, rather than a, in its entirety of, of commitment to, to the regions and really welcome the fact that obviously you're, you're going to look at that and, and hopefully that will change in, in the coming months and years. Um, the other indicator then is actually a, around the outworkings of that and, and what that means for, for communities in terms of investment, in terms of jobs. So um, I appreciate you mightn't have these figures at the minute, but um, if you do, it would be great. Um, if not, I would be grateful if, if you could come back with them just around what is the job assistance in, in say for example South Belfast, Central Belfast over the last 12 months compared to in the North West um, how do those figures relate because to me that actually even more than resource is a better indicator of, of where that regional balance piece is at I don't have the figures to hand I'll, I'll be honest but it's something that I'd be more than happy to come back with um, to your office and, and I think the reality is that when we look at the number of offers the amount of uh, assistance both grant um, and equity and activity levels within the portfolio and look at their geographic distribution across regions and locations within, within Northern Ireland they are driven by and reflect the location of the client portfolio So wherever we have lots of clients, whether they are existing local businesses founded and managed and owned in Northern Ireland or their inward inward investors, that's the basis for the focus of our activity. And therefore, if we want to change the dial so those those statistics are more in balance between various locations, we have to get more local business, local people and graduates coming out of the various colleges, establishing business in their local communities with our assistance and then sitting down opposite international investors and getting them to understand that Northern Ireland is about more than Belfast, that you have alternatives, you have optionality about where you can locate. And in saying that, I'm mindful as well that we also need to uh, look out for and nurture Belfast because it will always remain an important driver of overall activity within Northern Ireland. So I have a duty of care to Belfast, to Derry, to Craig Avon, Oma, Nuri, Fermanagh, etc. And that's something that we're going to incorporate more explicitly into our thinking, our strategy, and our structures. 
Ballin but I'll get those statistics. Lagan Valley. Lagan <laughs> <laughs> um, Valley, ABC. Go ahead. No, uh, just uh, one of the handbrakes um, that you're, you're going to be dealing with in terms sure. of productivity is the mass and cap. Um, in, in terms of student numbers, because um, it's a, like you know a self-inflicted hurt, and um, that we we all experience that we actually you know um, cap our, our our skills, and it's really driving down our productivity. Um, have you got any observations in that? Or are you working towards seeing how you can release the skills um, and grow the skills here in Northern Ireland to help support you um, have that proposition for for your investors? I, I say this respect. Uh, with respect. I've only recently been briefed on that constraint and my response was I need more graduates, yeah. not less. And um, I will trust on the political representatives and the assembly and the executive to try to resolve that problem. And if you can, it will sell, certainly help us to win more investment. For We've been waiting for 60 years for it to happen, so I hope it happens quickly for you. Oh, do you have that, that, that yes. rather impressive. Mm -hmm. so Sorry, uh, colleagues, Padraig has a question. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, no, definitely agree with, with your answer to, to my question. I, I don't think it's zero sum. Um, you know, everybody can benefit out of this. Um, my second question had actually been around mass and cap as well, but no, I appreciate the fact I've got, got a bit of clarity in that, and that allows me to, to go into a bit more depth on it as well, so no, that's great. Um, it's really just, just around that, um, I suppose, the, the graduate piece as well, but we're hearing from existing businesses and from businesses who are potentially looking at the Northwest specifically, um, as around the fact that we have a really highly skilled workforce, a highly educated workforce, and, and that's great. Um, so in terms of mass and cap in terms of student numbers as well um you know a, a key thing for us is to make university affordable to students is, is to avoid raising tuition fees within that as well um in terms of your your large corporate clients has there been any indication as to even in other jurisdictions has there been any research done into your graduate tax and do those large companies actually invest in um in students attaining um that university qualification and how that relates back into the workforce because we have a huge number of people who are coming out who are gaining those skills through our university, through our further education colleges as well. How does that relate back into those large companies? And, and I mean, have there been any conversations? How do they uh, invest in that? How do they focus that and actually drive that education piece forward as well? Because I think we can't look at the two in isolation. Um, they're obviously really linked, and, and I know Sinead has, has made that point as well. So. We're all on the same page here, I think, across the committee. So just to get a wee bit more information on that. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting question. I, I think all businesses, but particularly large companies and inward investors, have become more nuanced in their understanding of what they need to do to create a graduate pipeline. So rather than being passive receptors of public investment in education and what comes out the door from the universities, what I and others um, in an economic development role have been saying, particularly to large firms because they have the resources to do this, is to invest in the universities, mm -hmm. to establish graduate programs, to create uh, internships and to play a more active role in supporting uh, the third level system to create that graduate pipeline, to play a more active role in creating the skills that they need. Sitting down with educators and saying, these are the type of courses that we need you to put on and have students <coughs> educated in. And if you do this, this is what we can do for you on the, on the outside in terms of providing gainful employment for the graduates of those courses. So I think a more constructive, creative, co-design relationship between businesses and higher education is something that we need to do more of. I haven't, to be honest, had enough discussions with our large clients in Northern Ireland yet to understand their specific view on that, but in a previous experience, there's increasingly tighter relationships between the educational sector and, and large companies, all companies in fact. Absolutely, I can only speak for my own constituency, but those relations are, are very strong. Um, we, we look at large companies who have established those graduate schemes, um, those training programmes, so I think um, I would invite you to, to my constituency to look at those um, and, and I think there's a lot of learning for other constituencies from those. I know Northwest Regional College and Ulster are both heavily involved in that with local businesses so 
really positive opportunity for, for all our other areas to learn from that and, and to develop. I would be more than happy to do that and if we could package what I observe and learn on the day and socialise it um, with other stakeholders, uh, whether they're clients or education, we'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you for that offer. Very kind. And um, final question, Mr. Thank you, Chair. We've just had a conversation about skills and you've constantly referenced higher education. And I just want to make a play that, back to my first question at the start, I know you've responded and said you're only in the door, um, but it is so interesting whenever we reflect on these conversations that there is an automatic bias towards HE. And I would just make a play that actually, if you look at our skills ecosystem across the north, there are quite a lot of graduates and it's the missing middle. And we know that we don't have the same levels of entrepreneurship in Northern Ireland in comparison to the rest of the UK and also the South. So for me, I just want to make a plea to say, you know, I have a personal mission about getting parity between FE and HE. And as Philip said, you know, a lot of our constituents won't have degrees and they will never feel potentially in a situation where they will be able to gain a degree, but they will be able to gain work and work experience. And that, in my view, is also critically important in terms of giving them the life skills because Back to the very start of this, if we're using as a rough guide at this point in time, the medium wage in Northern Ireland, a lot of our people are never going to be able to get that. And we don't want that to exist. We don't want that to pertain. But if we're going to have those policy aims and objectives, we've got to look at different ways as well about bringing those people in. And we know that you referenced justice at the start. We know that a lot of people caught up in that system are actually, in a way, incredibly entrepreneurial. Um, and we want to get in and we want to put our arms around those young people that are marginalised. We want to speak to those people that have you know, come through trauma. And they're, in my view, and I'm sure everybody else's view, and yours, just as credible and just as important in terms of our inclusive growth. So I just wanted to make a pitch. I had to jump in because I was hearing itchy, itchy, and it was triggering. <laughs> and I was like, no, I need to say something. So I just wanted to make a wee play to all these you know, put the flag out for FE as well. Oh, that's and your point is, is well okay. made. Um, finally, just for me, as the only representative from Belfast on the committee, um, I did do my research uh, in terms of numbers. So 20 years of existence of uh, Invest NI from 2002 to 2023, 14,000 businesses supported, 77% outside of Belfast. Uh, 124,000 jobs uh, support through the creation of over the past 20 years and only 34% of those in Belfast. So yes, we need to have regional balance, but we also need to recognise that when we talk about uh, Belfast as the economic heart of Northern Ireland, that there are parts of it that have been underinvested into over many years. So we just need to look at that on the round. Okay. Mm -hmm. And with yeah. that, can I thank Michelle, Kieran, and Paul for their uh, attendance here. And we look forward to working with you uh, in the time ahead. Good timing, doing well. Peter, are you happy to give a summary of any actions agreed by members? Yes, Chair. So if I've understood correctly, then the uh, committee wants to write to the department seeking a regular update on the progress of uh, Invest and I. There are quite a few things happening in uh, 2024 you might want to keep up with, including um, uh, Invest and I and the department's plans around the development of a sub-regional model, including district councils and FE colleges. Um, we're also seeking sight of the new partnership uh, agreement that was mentioned. And um, we've writ previously written about the, the tender for the dual market access, mm -hmm. but we're also now going to write about the research that the Department <coughs> of on dual market access. And that was all I had, members. Committee agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, if we then move to item nine, members' correspondence. The first is correspondence, start at page 835. So uh, item two is at page 837. Members are asked to note correspondence from the Democratic Scrutiny Committee. Members content to note that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Item three at page uh, 848 is correspondence from the uh, ER, ESR. 
statutory rule assessor. Yeah, yes, um, yep. are people happy to content note their report? Yes. Thank you. Item four is a page nine one three. Is the committee content to note correspondence? So this is the uh, Public, Public Service Sir. Pensions Act at page nine one one three. It's all about the impact of the McLeod remedy. Mm -hmm. um, content to note. Content to note. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Item five then is a page. 983 and this is a copy of the ministerial written statement in respect of additional support for businesses affected by flooding clerk if we could just politely make the comment um, back to the department we don't need to formally write that the minister issued a statement to, to the media 24 hours in advance of informing the house and the committee of his decision was a very welcome one um, it should be for members to be informed yeah. first before the media i don't think we need to formally write or anything but just if we can flag that with the department of members are content mm -hmm. okay uh, if we move to item six then uh, members are asked to note a copy of a briefing paper from the mineral products association are we content to do that Yep. Okay. Item 7, uh, page 998, there is correspondence from the Secondary Students' Union of Ireland raising concerns about the ROI Central Applications Office. The committee content to write to the correspondence asking to give a little more detail in respect of the issues they wish to discuss. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Just for yes, a bit sir. of clarification on that, um, I, I think clarification has now been, been kind of reached on that in, in terms of South. Um, so it was largely around applicants applying to CEO system and, and vice versa as well. So Maria Farrell, who's our further and higher spokesperson of South and I have worked quite closely on that. So um, I, I think that they would. I, I mean, we could invite them on if, if other people are content with that because I think there's still um, a bit of uh, disparity between when the results come out from A-levels and when the results come out from CEO. And it's just linking that up um, across the country to make sure that the people can apply in, in both jurisdictions. And, and <laughs> <laughs> There's way more than that. That's that's one element of what my daughter went through the process. We went through as a flip. It's way more than that, and I'd be keen to the conversation around this is key. It's 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 beyond just the the time and time is one thing, mm -hmm. but you've no certainty. There's no uh, offer placing and anything like that within the south, and it needs to be looked at. A great great comparison is nowhere near what it is in the north. There's no, multiple. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. That's just one element, but yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Right. I was just going to say, Chair, I think the recommendation, I think we forget the detail back initially uh, yeah, and then yeah. maybe come back to it. And yeah. Yeah. Chair, and, and in and around that as well, there's no experts and schools to help support the students to actually make those applications. And it's another way of keeping skills closer to home as well. Absolutely. Okay. Sorry. I agree with with we seek more information. If if David was was content a one pager from yourself, on on your experience would, would yeah. not be unhelpful. Some homework. Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's called a hospital pass. Yeah, like, thank you. So if you could have that with the committee. I'll do it now. I'm flipping ten minutes. No problem. That's experience no, that, I never want to go through perfect. again. <laughs> Uh, item 8 members then is an invitation from uh, Belfast Harbour to hold a meeting and receive a tour. Uh, we can look at that in our future work plan if members are content. Yeah. Item 9 then is a page 1000. Members are asked to note a copy of correspondence from uh, Del Radian who have simply written to the Minister and see, see that in their members are content that we note. Yeah. And then item 10 is a meeting request which if members are content I'll consider. Is that agreed, members? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Item 11, uh, members are asked to know copies of the partnership agreements between the department and each of the further educational colleges. Members content to note? Agreed yes. Members, yeah. thank you. <coughs> Item 12, members are asked to consider an invitation from Londonderry Chamber of Commerce offering to host an economy committee meeting. As the committee has already agreed to hold a meeting in the foil region, the committee content to note correspondence. We agree. Yeah. Thank you. Item 13, members are asked to note further correspondence from Dr. Cook in respect to university applications. As the committee has already responded to these matters and owing to its busy forward work programme, is the committee content to respond, indicating that regrettably it can be no further assistance in resolving the issues yes. highlighted? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, item 14, another meeting request uh, from myself and members content that I look at that invitation. Thank you. Yeah. Item 15, uh, page 1459, members are asked to note correspondence indicating notice of publication of the interim progress report from the Association of British Insurers. Are members content to note that report? Is it agreed, members? That's 
Great, yeah. Great. yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thanks, uh, members. Thank okay, you. item 10, then forward work program. I refer members to the draft work forward work program of <coughs> 1464. Uh, some changes to the program assembly research will provide a brief next week on the economic context. The minister has now agreed to come to committee on the 20th of March, and our members content that we note that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other relevant business members? Nope. If, oh, yes, sir. Sorry. I was just wondering. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's not appropriate. Um, but in terms of just the situation between the FE colleges and the department, I was wondering if there was any progress in terms of the pay awards there, or just just how things were generally speaking. If there was an update to be had at all, if we could just even seek clarity on it. Okay, can write the department to that effect. Um, I suspect they'll give the answer they gave before that it's with the FE colleges uh, to, to negotiate with the unions. I would also anticipate that maybe <coughs> the minister might tell us something about that on the twentieth, because I suspect that would all have to be. I'm guessing that would all have to be done before the end of this financial year, and that would be his last chance to And I just received correspondence to say that the Minister is visiting the Newton Abbey College as we speak as an FE campus, so okay, perhaps so he may be making a, a positive announcement. Watch and brief. In that regard. Yeah, okay, okay, can I thank everyone for their attendance? Members, Jonathan, thank you for joining us online, and members, Thanks, we will sir. see you all next week. Thanks, members. Thank you. Thank Committee Room 30. Signed. Committee Room 30. Signed.